wonderful to see you all. Nice see. And, um, I'd, I'd like to, to start straight away by um, <laughs> welcoming you all. And uh, in a moment, I'm going to hand over to uh, the organizers. But um, so I'm Gordela Weiss Sussex. I'm one of the co directors of the uh, CCWW, the Center for the Study of Contemporary Women's Writing. And um, I just want to say how delighted I am about this conference. It is a hugely important topic. And um, the, the way that the organizers have thought about it and have organized it is, is just exemplary. And I think the, um, the program is absolutely fascinating. So the other thing I wanted to say is how well this conference fits in with the other um, the, the, you know, the, the larger program of uh, the CCWW this spring, we've had a whole range of events that are looking at vulnerability care. Um, uh, so there's, there was the conference on women's narratives of aging and care. There's been the seminar series, Who Cares? And all these events, if you have missed them, they are recorded, they are on our website. So I think for context, it would be wonderful uh, and would be really interesting for you to, 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 to have a look. But now, without further ado, and a huge thanks, uh, have a great two days and thank you again. Thank you so much, Godella, for that wonderful introduction. So I'd like to talk a little bit about how this series, uh, the seminar came about. So a conference, it was supposed to be a seminar series in the beginning, but we really wanted it to make it um, a two day event. So it is rooted around one of the main tenets of an ethics of care as pro proposed by Sandra Rogier, that the human is vulnerable. So we've seen that questions of vulnerability abound in current women centric, critical, cultural and social discourse, focusing on a broad spectrum of areas, um, including the body, affects and emotions, sexuality and health, to name but a few. So our interest in the notion of vulnerability uh, stemmed from an intersection of questions we've been posing ourselves in our own academic wor work, as well as in our uh, personal life. So within this current political and critical climate, which invites us or even insists on us revealing and working for our vulnerabilities, we wish to ask if a continuous and persistent self-excavation is necessarily beneficial. So we try to structure the conference uh, around three main questions, uh, starting with whether the female-centric discourse is at risk of using and abusing notions of vulnerability, if there can be an ethical differential categorization of vulnerability, and when does vulnerability lean um, into performance? So these are questions that we would like to see perhaps um, answered um, in the uh, this uh, today's and tomorrow's conference. So without further ado, um, Sandra can talk you through uh, the thank yous and the practicalities. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adina. And Godela, I have the lovely job of saying thank you to everybody who's helped us on the scenes and behind the scenes. So I'll start with uh, Godela and Shirley, who were very supportive of our idea from the very beginning when it sort of went on from a seminar series to um, to a conference. So we can't not say thank you to the Center for Contemporary Women's Writing and the IMLR, the Institute for Modern Languages Research, and to Jenny Stubbs, who is an absolute goddess behind the scenes. Some of you have seen her. We would not be logged in on Zoom if she wasn't here to, to help us. So thank you so much. And we appreciate the early mornings. It's a bit later tomorrow, so we've got that to compensate for. Uh, the conference wouldn't be here without all of you so thank you so much to the participants to everybody everybody who submitted abstracts who has offered to chair and who's helped us uh, throughout so we really look forward to to sort of seeing all of you and hearing all of you and it's very much your conference and then I'll say an advanced thank you to our two fantastic keynotes, our three fantastic keynotes, one of whom is logged in this morning. Thank you so much, Catherine. But we'll come back to the, to the keynotes as well when we've got those amazing talks. And last but not least, thank you so much to the John Coffin Memorial Fund, because we wouldn't be able to have uh, authors without the financial support of the Institute and the funds that they put forward and people can apply for. And that's the thank yous. I hope I haven't missed anybody. If I've got two days, it's not like the Oscars when you only have 20 seconds. So if I've missed anybody, I'll make sure to make it up to them uh, today and tomorrow. And as we wait for sort of for people to log in, because I suspect that some people might log in at half eight, I'll just give a couple of sort of um, 
housekeeping um, element. So I think by now everybody's used to to Zoom. But what I've discovered is that once you sort of go back to in in person teaching, you kind of forget what Zoom is about. So it's it's always good to sort of remember those. We've checked everything for the first two panels. So thank you so much for the for the participants who've logged in super early to check PowerPoints and everything. We really appreciate it. Um, and then some of the sessions will be recorded. So if you don't want to be recorded, then just turn your camera off. And if you would like your question to be anonymous, then just send it to the chair or to myself and Adina in the chat, and then we will read it out or send it to the person who's chairing the panel. Similarly, if you just want to ask a question, you just put your hand up um, and then, you know, the chair will, will ask you to unmute yourself. If you can be on mute when somebody else is speaking, that would be great just so that there's no background sounds. It also means that you can have a chat or go and make yourself a cup of coffee, which is always good. Um, so, yeah, just mute yourself if you're if you're not speaking. Cameras on or off, it's it's your it's your choice. And then just hands up. But it's going to be quite, you know, quite informal. I think we've, we've been through this so many times that we probably know by by default how to, uh, how to do it. We've still got about seven minutes until sort of proper kickoff. So I'm just wondering whether people want to go and get a cup of coffee or tea or anything. Can we say something about the format of the panels? Yeah, so we've got, so and then if you've looked at the programme, in the um, we've got two panels back to back, but then we've got a longer break. So we've always tried to sort of compensate in the programme for, uh, for the early panels or the late panels. Um, so we've got three speakers in both of the panels and the speakers will be speaking for about 15 to 20 minutes. Um, so obviously we'll keep times, but I think again, by this point, people sort of know when 15 to 20 minutes uh, is up. And then we'll have questions from the audience. So you've seen in the program that there's plenty of time. We've sort of scheduled about half an hour for, for each of the panels at the end. So we'll listen to all of the papers and then we'll take questions from for, two, for all of the speakers. Um, and we've got breaks, but we've got you know plenty of time. If the discussions want to continue, you could always just uh, stay on the Zoom call as well and just carry on the discussions. Or if you've thought of any collaborations or anything like that, just feel free to use the, the Zoom room. Um, and then we'll have our fantastic keynote from Helen and Darina. Darina is logging in from Cannes, from the film festival. So we'll get a chance to see a glimpse of the film festival and the sea <laughs> in the background, which I think is fantastic. Uh, the sun is shining out here in Bath, so you never know. It, we might we might be sort of rivaling the, the South Coast. I doubt it, but there you go. Um, so then we have another break. And then we've got our sort of later later panels as well. And it's a similar program tomorrow, but we start a bit later to, to compensate. And I do encourage you, we've got Van Donneur on Friday evening. I do encourage you to bring a, bring a glass of wine, bubbly, or any drink of your choice to sort of celebrate the, the weekend and the conference. So the, the panels are gonna follow um, the usual format. So we'll be having the free uh, papers in a row and then we'll have a q a uh, with everyone at the end so to be equitable and it, it'll be similar for the keynote as well i mean i've mentioned this in the first keynote but we've got a a mix of um elements we've got a presentation we've got readings i've got a couple of questions from myself and then open to to the audience because i think I'm you'll have I'm, i've been tweeting just so you know if you see me on my phone no, we, we, we want to take over the Twitter net. <laughs> I'm not on Twitter, but it's like, let's be trending. Whatever, whatever that means. Um... So I, I think I will wait just for the sort of the extra four minutes, just in case people want to log in. So this would be a great opportunity to, to get a drink. When, when you wait for students and then you have yeah. none, and then you're hoping, yes, maybe, because I have so much other work, but then one or two show up and then I'm disappointed. But this is not that, that situation. You're going to feel excited to see more people. It's quite early. We're very sorry, but we're trying to accommodate all the time zones and it's been a, a mammoth task. And if I didn't have Sandra, um, we'd all be logging in at 3 a.m. I think. So thank you very much, Sandra. Teamwork makes the dream work. So yes, especially thank well, you. Well, me. maybe if we have a few minutes, maybe yeah. I can jump in and say yes. a few more words if that's okay. Um, so the way the the um, center works is um, that uh, we well we are more a virtual center as it were than a, than a real sort of you know we all work fully employed for this center center. 
And um, so it works because people uh, have ideas, have ideas for conferences, for seminar series, um, etc. And we have a particular focus on early career researchers. And we very much encourage early career researchers to come forward with ideas, anything to do with contemporary women's writing. We are particularly interested in uh, cross-cultural, cross-lingual um, uh, explorations, but we're also happy to, um, to do you know, one language uh, work. Come, come to us with your ideas. Um, we can help you shape it if you want us to. And we are always very happy to organize um, or help you organize uh, seminar series or indeed conferences. There are, like Sandra was, was already saying, there are opportunities for uh, applying for funding. And we are currently making steps towards going back to in-person uh, events. And I think that that'll be a juggling thing and we'll, we'll, we'll feel our way towards it. At the moment, um, uh, our, so, so we are based in Senate House uh, of, uh, of the University of London on Russell Square. And at the moment, our hybrid facilities are not good enough to, uh, to host hybrid events. We are promised that that will change by June. Um, well, let's say September. To, to be, you know, to be realistic. So we are hoping that by September we'll have, we'll be able again to offer the choice um, for organizers between in-person and online events. So all this just to say, if you have any ideas, if you'd like to do an event with us, just let me know. Please do, because they're a fantastic center and I've been with them since my academic babyhood, um, since I used to go to seminars and attend and I've organized a couple of events there and I was a visiting fellow a few years back. So I really advise the center. And also for further advice, there's Adalgisa Giorgio, who I can see here. Hi, Adalgisa, um, and who, who has you know, has been for this with the center forever and really has a lot of experience and knowledge about how it works. So if you'd like to speak to Anna I'm sure she'd be happy to. Thank you so much. And that brings us nicely to 8.30, actually. So I'm, uh, the, the dreaded minute of silence that I don't like in invigilating exams has passed. So I think we can uh, kickstart our, our conference with panel number one. And I have the pleasure of, channel, of chairing panel number one, which is called Tell Me What You Want on Vulnerability and Age. Um, so I will be presenting every speaker and then handing over to them for about 15 to 20 minutes. If the speakers need me to tell them how time is passing, I'm very happy to do that. But otherwise, I don't want to interrupt you. So just let me know what you prefer. And I can always give you a, a bit of a shout one or two minutes before time if you want it to. Our first speaker is Douglas Murray, who is reader in French studies at the University of Warwick. He is the author of Michel Welbeck, Humanity and its Aftermath published in 2013 with Un Liverpool University Press, and of several works on French cinema. His current research is focusing on toxic masculinity in French literature of the 1968 generation, Philippe Solers, Serge Dubrovsky, and Gabriel Matzneff. And the title of his paper today is Du consentement et de la cavalière, Exploring Consent in the Era of Sexual Liberation with Vanessa Springora and Nathalie Quentin. Over to you. Uh, thank you, Sandra. Um, and so on the question of timing, uh, I think I do have about 20 minutes and uh, I, I won't be able to see you if you wave at me because I'll be reading from the screen. So, but uh, do give me a shout if you think I'm going a bit, a bit slowly. I'll try and go quickly. Um, so I just wanted to start with a disclaimer, which is to say that uh, it's a bit of a dubious honor to be asked to speak first when one is one of only a tiny handful of men at a conference about women's cultural production. It's not the first time I've been in this situation, but I think it's the first time I've been asked to speak first. Um, but uh, my excuse is that I, uh, I asked to go early because I have childcare responsibilities in the afternoon and Sandra and Nadina took me up my word. Like, you want early? You got early. Um, okay, so 
Exploring Consent in the Era of Sexual Liberation with Vanessa Springora and Nathalie Quintan. Uh, this paper considers two recent publications by French women writers that evoke in different ways sex scandals from several years ago. Vanessa Springora's Consent from 2020 tells of her seduction, or we might, we might now say her grooming, at the age of 14 by the notorious French writer Gabrielle Matzneff, who was 35 years her senior. Nathalie Quintan's La Cavaliere, published in 2021, tells of a woman teacher who was removed from her role in the 1970s after being accused of incitation des mineurs à la débauche, literally inciting minors to debauchery, if we could translate it literally. Um, so one of these books, uh, in which the woman is a victim, became a bestseller, was widely translated, sparked a national public debate, and even helped bring about a change in French law. The other, in which the woman is a perpetrator, passed more or less unnoticed. One, despite the good intentions of the author to explore the psychological impact of her youthful liaison and to demonstrate the complicity of the French establishment in the 1980s, resulted in an unseemly witch hunt against uh, one man and fed into the reactionary backlash against the spirit and ideas of 1968 France. Sorry, I forgot to move on my slide. Uh, the other, despite apparently exposing some of the utopian excesses of the period. Okay, in fact, sorry, in, to, yeah. sorry to interrupt you, but you're not yep. sharing your slides. So if you are moving oh, sorry, the slides, sorry, sorry, I think sorry. it might be useful for the others to see them. Sorry, sorry yeah. to, to ruin no. the flow. <laughs> uh, there, we are. there we go. Fantastic. Thank you so much. I thought I'd forgotten something. Um, so the other book then, La Cavaliere, uh, despite exposing some of the utopian excesses of the period, in fact invites us to reconsider carefully what we might yet learn from uh, that time and how its political turbulence may in fact bear meaningful comparison to our own troubled era. Uh, so I'm going to start then by talking about Le Consentement. Um, Springora's book has been widely interpreted as an account of her grooming at the hands of a predatory older man. Indeed, the subtitle to the UK paperback edition, which you can see here, is A Memoir of Stolen Adolescence. Springora describes herself as a perfect victim or prey, an isolated bookish child with an absent father and a preoccupied mother. Springora repeatedly stresses that she consented to sexual activity with Metzneff. She says, for instance, I wasn't afraid of G. He would never force me to stay against my will. I was sure of that. And G, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah. And at 14, uh, his attention makes her feel special, adored as never before. I felt I had been chosen, she says. It was only later as her adolescence sank into trouble at school, substance abuse and eating disorders, that she began to realize that her consent had been manipulated from her, that she had been become, in her own words, like a doll lacking all desire, who had no idea how her own body worked, who had learned only one thing, how to be an instrument for other people's games. Um, now, perhaps surprisingly, Springora chooses not to condemn underage sex, insisting that love has no age limit. L'amour n'a pas d'âge, she says in French. She's able to imagine a scenario in which a man of Matzneff's age and a 14-year-old girl could experience a genuinely sublime, in her words, and thus by implication, innocent love for one another. Rather, what made her feel used and degraded was Gabrielle Matzneff's uh, serial seduction of young girls, the sense that she was not an exception, but simply the latest conquest in a chain of compulsive predation. Springer uh, knew this to be the case, not as Matzneff suggests in his own diary of the affair, uh, the cover of which you can see on this slide, um, not as a result of her jealous imagination, but from the published evidence of his own books. Matzneff's uncommonly promiscuous sex life was fodder for his literary career uh, and vice versa. Springer's painful and private story thus became a key chapter in the master narrative of a self-aggrandizing mythomaniac. Now, unfortunately, uh, the discursive specificity of this point was missed by much of the book's reception. Um, as Hélène merlin Kaiman has argued, Le Consentement was received as something more like a witness statement than a work of literature, uh, the self-refashioning through words that we can see it as. In this way, the reader becomes a juror invited to confirm the guilt of the accused. 
And this is, of course, exactly what happened with a massive press and public campaign against Matzneff and the withdrawal of his books from circulation, his effective cancelling and rarely has the word seemed more appropriate, as a member of the French cultural sphere, concluding in a widespread disavowal of any literary merit to his works. The publication of Le Consentement was routinely cited as a key moment in the French Me Too movement, with Matzneff frequently and I think probably unfairly compared to other unmasked abusers like Harvey Weinstein and Jeffrey Epstein. Uh, the particularly French flavor to this affair, however, allowed the blame to be placed squarely on the shoulders of the 1968 generation. Uh, the French writer Laure Murat described Le Consentement as a book denouncing, quote, the violence of a system that obliged a very young girl to think she was desired, sorry, to think that she desired what was imposed upon her. Now, this is far from inaccurate, yet curiously recalls much of the critique of desire under consumer capitalism that prevailed around 68. Without wishing to make light of the real suffering of abuse victims, doesn't the violence of a system, whether it be Instagram or mass pornography, oblige all of us in one way or another to desire what is imposed upon us? The pedophile is the perfect scapegoat enabling us to look conveniently away from the moral hypocrisies of patriarchal consumerism. Children and young girls are routinely sexualized by the fashion and music industries. We know that girls mature more rapidly than boys. The tastes, attitudes, and behaviors of adolescent boys are ridiculed and demonized in the media. Older men are regularly paired with younger partners in screen culture. Mass culture continues to present the erotic ideal of a dominant man and a submissive woman, an ideal that is apparently desired by literally billions of individuals around the world. And yet, when a young girl is attracted to an older man, we must some somehow assume that she has been manipulated. And while a man is attracted to a young girl, he is taken to be a pervert and a criminal. The media furore around Matzneff's Pedo criminality, as it's been labeled, uh, in fact, conceals a variety of different behaviors. So it is clear that he engaged in sex tourism in North Africa and Southeast Asia, and there were a handful of consensual, and obviously that term is problematic, consensual relationships with underage partners like Vanessa Springora in France. But the majority of Matzneff's sex life on the evidence of his diary, and now that evidence is itself problematic, and that's a, a, another question, um, the majority of his sex life seems to have consisted of admittedly very numerous hookups with girls aged around 16 to 20. He seems not to have used money or power to trick unsuspecting women into sex like Epstein or Weinstein. Matzneff's physical beauty and easy charm, both of which stemmed from his aristocratic inheritance, evidently exerted a real pull for most of his adult life. I suspect that some of the disgust inspired by Matzneff, um, some of the disgust inspired by Matzneff may also betray a residual homophobia sparked by the fact that the author, not content with deflowering scores of French maidens, also never stopped sleeping with boys. While it is understandable that women's voices have been amplified in the Matzneff affair in the context of Me Too, it's curious that no male victims have come forward, perhaps an effect of the more fleeting nature of these liaisons and thus of the author's more discreet evocation of them in print that would minimize emotional investment and the concomitant scars. Given the author's non-binary sexuality, we might ask what value may be drawn from queering Gabrielle Matzneff. Kaji Amin, for instance, points out that pederasty has moved in the space of a century from being, quote, a dominant male same-sex relational form to the dusty and sad relic of a sexual past imagined as both distant and repressive. Despite its claims to represent marginal sexual practices, queer theory and culture now reproves pederasty, demonstrating what Amin calls its indebtedness to a liberal egalitarian tradition it nonetheless continually sets itself against. Intergenerational sex, by which I don't necessarily mean sex with children, intergenerational sex disturbs precisely because it makes explicit the fetishization of power that is implicit in so much sex. It is, says Amin, a non-egalitarian, non-reciprocal sexualization of social hierarchy. But in the heady days of sexual liberation after 1968, when the, the walls, we could read on the wall, jouissez sans entrave, 
Uh, in those days, what Michel Foucault called the diagonal lines of desire uh, appeared to some, including Matzneff, of course, but also people like Guy Orkangem, Michel Foucault himself, or Deleuze and Guattari, appeared as offering the potential for new models of social organization, new elective communities away from the stifling compulsory structure of the family. So I'll leave that there and I'll move on to uh, the second book I'm looking at, La Cavaliere. So the reader of Le Cavalier may be expecting from advanced publicity a piece of investigative journalism regarding a forgotten sex scandal of the 1970s. In fact, in the opening pages of the book, it's not easy for the reader to orient herself or to situate the events recounted. This is due to a sometimes deliberate and sometimes I suspect accidental intermingling of voices in the uh, narration. Nathalie Quintan herself works as a school teacher in the same town, Digne les Bains, in the Alps, as Nelly Cavallero, the disgraced teacher of the 1970s. First person sentences could be her own or unattributed quotations from witnesses she interviews. This is, as Quintan stresses, what marks her book out as a work of literature rather than a simple document. The facts of the case uh, are never explicitly addressed by Quintan, but only evoked through newspaper headlines that are clearly framed as being sensationalist or biased. Digne gripped by debauchery, we read, and the demon with the face of an angel. A 15-year-old victim, uh, again, victim, inverted commas, testifies, he showed me things I'd never done before. So Nelly Cavallero was effectively accused of supplying underage sexual partners to a gay friend uh, to whom she also provided a lodging. Although in Cavallero's own assess assessment, uh, published in a tract distributed at the time, her only crimes were being a politicized woman teacher, attempting to organize sex education classes in school, and being a friend to a gay man. Quintan makes no specific comment about the allegations of targeting underage partners for sex, but she evokes, uh, for instance, uh, Christiane Rochefort's 1969 novel Printemps au Parking, in which a teenage schoolboy runs away from home and falls in love with a male university student. Rochefort claimed to have lost her own virginity at 13 and a half, which in her words was late compared to some. Quintan also relegates to a footnote uh, a reference to the case of Gabrielle Russier, a teacher accused of sleeping with a 16-year-old pupil in 1967, who was given a suspended prison sentence and took her own life in 1969. The boy, interviewed after her death, stated simply, we loved each other, they put her in prison, she killed herself, simple. As the book progresses, it becomes clear that Quintan is less interested in the sordid details of some long forgotten sex scandal than in French national education's retaliation against leftist teachers after 1968. Uh, only a woman, uh, sorry, I've lost my place. One second. Only a woman dedicated to, uh, quote, the search for and the public expression of the truth could be struck off like this, Quintan suggests. On the basis of her inquiry, Quintan estimates that only four or five out of perhaps 60 teachers in a school would actually seek to teach differently, a comparable proportion to her own experience in recent decades, and those rebels would typically be met by systemic resistance and ultimately sanctions. When the entire structure of the institution is based around discipline, argues Quintan, it's difficult to imagine anything else. Uh, as she puts it, either shut your mouth or cause chaos, one or the other. Who really wants autonomy? Who even knows what it is, how it could be achieved or organized? But a nation in which you are afraid to tell the truth for fear of losing your job, your livelihood, is not truly a democracy, Quintan states boldly. Uh, and in this sense, she writes in one of the most incendiary passages of the book, France's fascist government in Vichy was not a temporary anomaly, but something like the true face of the country's authoritarian tendencies. As she puts it bluntly, there is no nation, there is only a pacification of the provinces. La Cavaliere, in other words, is not really about a sex scandal, but is rather a reassessment of the legacy of an era of radical political action and contestation. Quintan begins misleadingly by stressing, as did so many commentators on the Metznev affair, how distant this era now feels to us. Uh, these are the opening sentences of the book. It was so long ago, such a different time, no comparison to our own. But a few pages later, she stresses how, as a teacher, she is accustomed to evoking other times, reminding her pupils of how not so very long ago and not so far from where they are sitting, French people went to war against each other. 
She deploys cultural materials, not just the novel of uh, Christian Rochefort, for instance, but the films of Philippe Garel or Alain Tanner, to evoke a time when a disenfranchised generation turned their backs on a society of work and consumerism. The uncompromising graffito of 1968, Ne travaillez jamais, uh, is now regarded, uh, as Quintan suggests, as a literary phrase, a kind of tactical slogan deployed in order to obtain something from a stingy management. At the time, however, the utopian injunction to never work was taken literally at face value. Young people dropped out of society or scraped a living, recycling waste food from the market where necessary in a practice that, curiously enough, has become current once again and has now even been given the modish sobriquet of free cycling. But this spirit of freedom was frowned upon and repressed by the authorities. A friend of Nelly's uh, recalls her skinny dipping in a local swimming hole with quelques jeunes, were these her pupils, Quintan doesn't specify, and the way the surrounding foliage was cut back in order to prevent repeat instances of such depravity. The speaker makes a direct comparison to the heavy-handed policing of young people's social lives during COVID-19, asking, why don't they protest more? Likewise, uh, the violent police repression um, of youth protest after 1968, in which a young man called Richard Dehé, for instance, lost an eye, is implicitly compared to the authoritarian policing of the Gilets Jaunes movement, in which that same mutilation became symbolic of the brutality of the French forces of order, so-called. Uh, Quintan recalls a radio documentary as recently as 2018 that presented the supposed excesses of the 68 generation as laughably distant. Two years later, and it's that radio program itself that appears woefully out of step with reality. Uh, as Quintan writes, political violence is erupting everywhere. A civil war in France is no more impossible than an insurrection. Nor does Quintan have any patience with those who would label May 68 the last utopia. Instead, she argues the militants and the hippies of that generation were just one instantiation of a radical idea equality for all, that has been a recurring trope of human civilization since at least early Christianity. What was remarkable about that era, Quintana asserts, is that for the space of a few years, a section of the population chose to stop being afraid, afraid of joblessness, of dishonor, and of each other. Uh, for the first time in their life, she says, the little bosses, the landlords, the teachers and inspectors and upstanding fathers met with stupefaction the sovereign gaze of women and men who were no longer afraid. For women like Nelly Cavallero, an openness to sexuality was a fundamental part of this fearlessness. For a brief time, sex and revolution were inextricably linked in the sense that having sex and talking about sex were regarded as part of a wider process of social and political renewal whose ambition knew no bounds. Now, of course, sex is still widely discussed and represented, more so than ever, and its political significance is frequently acknowledged, but its radical potential as part of an openness to the other in a spirit of refusal of the capitalist logic of private property and mutual mistrust has become utterly foreign to us. Quintan describes a sex education lesson in her school today as, quote, uh, an interminable list of all the forms of harassment and violence. There's a lot of yawning and slouching. Quintan concludes that it is important for us to gather these testimonies of the 68 generation while there's still time, so as not to lose all memory of a small group of people uh, who lived in the sun and without fear for a handful of months, as she puts it. So in conclusion, why read these two books, Le Consentement and La Cavalière, together? Is there not something obfuscatory or even insulting in comparing a wrongfully accused teacher with pro progressive feminist intentions in the 1970s to a self-satisfied male writer whose serial predation of young sex partners was not merely condoned as a result of his celebrity, but in a mutually reinforcing vicious circle actually underlay that celebrity in the first place. These cases are different, even if many of uh, Matineff's partners consented enthusiastically, and even if Nelly Cavallero may have taken advantage of some of her students, they're different because consent is gendered. Uh, the legalistic presumption of the equality of straight sex partners does not exist in fact. As Manon Garcia reminds us, 
Um, historically, women had little choice, economically or morally, to con but to consent to marriage, uh, which union effectively guaranteed in advance their consent to all future sexual and economic decisions made by their husband. It is also the case, as Amir Srinivasan points out, that the majority of student-teacher relationships see a powerful man exploiting a younger woman's respect and admiration and aggressively recasting it into the typically patriarchal form of heterosexual desire. That said, I also share Srinivasan's mistrust of carceral feminism for its documented impact disproportionately upon communities of color and thereby upon the women of those communities. And I regret that Vanessa Springora's powerful memoir resulted above all in the persecution of one man that allowed a complicit establishment to return more or less to business as usual. Francesca G, another of Matzneff's victims, likened the affair to, quote, a controlled explosion. Utopian though it may be, I find the stress on hope and fearlessness in Nathalie Quintan's book to be more deeply invigorating. Manon Garcia has recently made the case for recasting sexual consent as an ongoing conversation between the sexes. That is well and good, provided the conversation may also have the scope to position sexual needs and vulnerabilities within the urgent context of our fragile democracies and our imperiled planet. Uh, so that's the end. I will stop sharing my screen. Thanks. Thank you so much, Douglas. What a brilliant paper to get us started for the day and for the conference. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Dominique Carlini Versini, who is an assistant professor in French at Durham University and is a specialist of contemporary women's writing and filmmaking. Her first monograph, Le Corps Frontière, Figure de l'excès chez Marie Dariussec, Virginie Despentes, and Marina Devant, in which she examines figures of excess in women's writing and filmmaking as a way to question bodily borders, will be published by Brill in the Fort Titre series in 2023. Her research appeared in journals such as Women in French Studies, Dalhousie French Studies, L'Esprit Créateur, or Revue Critique de Fiction Française Contemporaine. And her most recent article, Corps Spectral, Corps Précaire, Vernon Subutex de, Virg de Virginie Despentes, is featured in the most recent issue of French Studies. Her paper today is entitled Reading Marie Dariussex Clève with Vanessa Springoraz, Le Consentement. Over to you. Feel free to share your slides. And over to you. Thank you, Dominique. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sandra, for the introduction. Um, I will so try to show my screen, which should work. Can you see it now? Yes. Yes. Excellent. Um, oops. Okay. Um, so I will also talk about uh, Vanessa Springer has le consentement um, or consent. Uh, but I will focus a little bit more on, on Clef because Douglas uh, has already said um, a lot on, on, on consent. So I will try not to, to duplicate uh, too much of, of what he, um, of the excellent thing he has said uh, with us today. Uh, so when it was first published in, in 2011, Marie Darius X Clef received some critical attention uh, for its graphic treatment of sex and the body. However, most of the novel's mixed reviews, uh, reviews seem to focus on the explicit references to sexual organs and bodily fluids uh, disseminated in the text, and little attention was given to the romantic and sexual relationship between the teen protagonist Solange and her adult neighbor and occasional babysitter, Monsieur Biot. Reading the novel again in the Prism Me Too era sheds a new, a new light on the question of consent in the text. Uh, in addition, uh, France has faced a particular reckoning with the notion in the wake of the publication of uh, Springer has consent, um, in which, as Douglas not noted, the writer narrator tells the story of her romantic and sexual relationship with the then 50-year-old uh, Gabrielle Metznev when she was only 40. Um, so the relationship took place in the 80s at, the time, at a time where the artistic world in France was still very much influenced by the rhetoric of sexual freedom inspired by May 68 and the following years. Springer notes that the relationship and the many others Matt Snap had with other uh, teenage girls and boys indeed uh, were well known in Parisian literary circles and regularly featured in his books. So I will discuss today um, Sexual Violence and Consent in these two texts published in the pre and post Me Too period. 
and show how the two narratives can enter in dialogue in the way that depicts the difficulty to maneuver the young female's character relation, uh, relationship to the male other. And we'll show that images of activity and passivity, predators and praise are mobilized and blurred in both texts to question and problematize um, vulnerability and agency. Um, so we start uh, by discussing Clev, uh, which is Darius X's eighth uh, novel and tells the story of Solange, a young girl who goes through uh, puberty. The story divided in three parts, getting it, referring to her period, and doing it and doing it again, uh, referring to her um, early sexual encounters. The text uh, narrated in the third person is often very close to Solange's point of view and embraces the language of adolescence. The narrative shows a certain candor in the crudest descriptions of uh, phenomena that affect the body, as we will see in a second. Through her narrative, Darius X seeks to give a new place to the language um, and the body of the young girl, as well as to reveal hidden aspects of the female physical experience, notably in relation to the thorny notions of consent, as noted in the call for papers for today's conference. Um, so Solange's first sexual experience with a teenage boy called Arnaud raises the question of consent. So I will not read out the scene which uh, appears on the screen, um, but I will comment on it as you read, I hope. Uh, sorry, it, because it's quite long, uh, so writing might be a bit small, so I hope everyone can see. Uh, so the language used in the scene is crude, but also uh, childlike. The point of view adopted allows the reader to be immersed in Solange's experience and not to be her candor, vulnerability and sensations. The scene uh, is problematic and raises several questions. Is it rape or consensual sex? Can one consent um, to a relationship that one cannot identify? The emphasis is placed on the incongruous aspects of the, of the situation in Solange's eyes the pain she feels, and the violence imposed on her body. Uh, so we can note various attempts to put a name on the act of anal sex, the expression of surprise, and the use of an authority reference, Nathalie, to try to understand how Solange should behave and what is happening to her. The excerpt also highlights the violence done to her body, Arnaud is represented in the, uh, as the active element, while Solange is characterized by her passivity and uh, loses her position as subject. He is a subject of active verbs or verbs that underline his determination. He straight, uh, straightens her up, he's clutching at her. Solange is either the object of the verb or the subject of verbal groups uh, expressing indecision. She tries. She doesn't dare, she should. Uh, similarly, the transcription of the dialogue between Solange and Arnaud on the page represents the power relationship between them as Solange's words are transcribed uh, using italics. Um, this type, uh, typographical choice uh, creates a visual distinction on the page between the two voices. Italics are usually used to draw attention to a word or a phrase. Here, um, it is a way to highlight Solange's words while they are delib deliberately ignored by Arno. The text thus inscribes uh, within its form the violence done to Solange's body. Um, later in the narrative, Solange has sex for the first time with um, Monsieur Biot, uh, so her babysitter that I mentioned um, earlier on. Um, so in the following scene, uh, which you can see on the screen. Um, so again, I think um, I'll read the beginning, but I'll let you uh, carry on reading as, as I will comment. So she's not crying anymore. She's concentrate, concentrating very hard. She's sighing and panting. She's riding up and down, sitting squarely on his thighs, like on a horse, uh, but still not quite like that. He's kissing her passionately, 
She turned her head away and shut her eyes, but he smiled to follow her, wet and gulping. Shh. She sits up straight, but not too straight, so the thing doesn't slip out. So the right, so she's right up close, right there, um, so that it rubs when she goes down again and she goes down hard. That's it. That's good. Um, so very a very different uh, depiction of um, of sex with an adult here. Uh, in the scene, Solange is the, uh, in the active position, in the position of power. She is a subject of most of the action verbs. Little space is given to uh, Miss, Monsieur Biot's desire, which is uh, only rarely subject objectified by Solange's sexual desire and appetite. The italics are used here again to emphasize the loving behavior of the male character in opposition to Solange's selfish desire. In fact, Biot's attitude is denied by Solange's gesture and by the exclamation in, re in response to his desire, uh, which seeks to silence him as she is exclusively focused on her own pleasure. Um, the use of the animal comparison also introduces a hierarchical relationship between the two character, characters, sorry, uh, Solange being a horse and Monsieur Biot a cat. The comparison using the first except two, um, where there's a dog-like images, also suggests in a, grotesque, in a grotesque way the dissolution of the boundaries between human and animal during sex. Monsieur Biot is completely objectified, reduced to body parts, and opposed to Solange, Solange's physical and sexual power. It's a simple tool, a thing, dedicated to her own, to her own pleasure, which allows Solange to reach orgasm and become supersonic and roaring, so another adjective here, um, which places her in a more predatory almost position, uh, and which is contrasted with uh, Monsieur Biot's gentle meowing. Finally, the scene also questions a cliche uh, conception of the loss of virginity, one of Darius X ambition in the narrative, since here the feelings are uh, more on the side of the older man, the experience is painless and a source of great pleasure to the young girl. The great social right of passage is in the end um, hardly worth making a fuss about. Yet the relationship depicted involves an older man and a young girl, um, which therefore places Solange in a more vulnerable position. The extract represents a situation that is uh, ethically problematic and uh, would be considered um, to be rape under con uh, contemporary law, which um, with the change of law uh, mentioned um, earlier and brought on by um, uh, the publication of consent. Uh, but here, this is presented as a positive experience for the girl. Unlike Arnaud, Biot cares for Solange, and the, te the text remains morally ambiguous about their relationship, refusing to offer a clear resolution to the reader. In fact, Biot uh, increasingly appears to be the vulnerable one in the relationship after Solange uh, breaks it up through um, a note, threatening him to report him to the police, um, and he attempts to commit suicide as a result. So in the case of the relationship between Springoha and Metznev, uh, and as Douglas noted, the element of active consent is clearly emphasized by Springoha. Uh, by Springoha. She states um, in, multi, uh, in various ways that she experienced the relationship as consensual at the time, and she describes the beginning of their affair in terms of mutual love. Um, so she says, G declared his love for me in every possible way, begged me to come back and see him as soon as I could, vowed he couldn't live without me, that life wasn't worth living a moment longer if he wasn't, uh, if, I, yeah, if he wasn't in my arms, sorry. And a few pages later, I was in love, I felt adored as never before, and that was enough to face all my sullenness and to suspend any judgment about our relationship. In addition, the perception of consent and mutual love makes the narrator feel in control of her life. 
Springer's father beca uh, became absent from her life after her parents experienced a difficult divorce and her relationship with Matt Snev brings her the validation she des desperately seeks from older men. In the text, Springer explains how she felt fulfilled in many ways uh, by uh, this forbidden love, uh, as she describes it. This is certainly uh, a way to show his power over her. Um, but I would argue that the two texts uh, seem um, to share the same view that a romantic relationship can exist, and that's also what Douglas um, pointed out, can exist between an adult and a teenager. The point that Springer makes in the book is that had he loved her exclusively, their relationship could have existed, uh, and that as if there was a scenario in which the relationship could have been fulfilling and not um, exploitative. At the same time, and unlike Diosex text, Springer has narratives shows very eloquently the manipulation at play uh, and how in addition to the sexual violence, Matt's nerve predation extends to all aspects of her life. He seeks to exert full control over her person by getting her from her, uh, from her friends and family members and by interfering with her school life. Springer writes about her love for books and writing from a very young age. She explains uh, that one of the ways he used to control her was to insist on writing one uh, of her literary assignments. And she says, and so the dispossession began. After this, um, G showed no more interest in my school work, never encouraged me to write or pushed me to think about what I might like to do with my life he was the writer, end of quote. So in the example, Masnev literally deprives uh, Springer from her individual voice. The book deals with the traumatic aftermath of the relationship and Springer's writing highlights very powerful, uh, powerfully the traps of consent uh, and the devastation the relationship caused her. She describes the physical and mental collapse she experienced after she left him and once she realized what had happened to her. She also shows that going back to writing is for her a way to reclaim her agency. And in in that the book is about deconstructing Matt Snuff's strategy using his own weapons, literature, and even as um, Elsa Court notes, and I quote, the same literary form that her abuser had mastered the memoir, end of quote. Hence, in Springer has sex, Matznev is reduced to the simple letter um, G as part of her project to reclaim her agency over him. Indeed, the declared aim of the book is to trap him. Uh, and she starts the book by saying, why not ens ensnare the hunter in his own trap, ambush, ambush him within the pages of a book. So, as I tried to demonstrate um, through the close readings of the text, Darius X text prefigures and echoes um, Springer has in some ways. Both texts complicate our understanding of what vulner vulnerability, sexual violence, and the myriad um, of power relationships that can be at play between two people. At the, same, at the same time, there are very different texts. And while Daya's ex narrative is inspired uh, from her own experience as a teenager, it uses the power of fiction to draw sketches and gives us uh, glimpses into Solange's perception, whereas consent is a deep and personal exploration of a broken self. They also must give us a very lucid and striking portrait uh, of 1980s France and of the uh, normalization of sexual relationships between adults and young people at the time. Um, finally, they offer us a better understanding of contemporary France too. As I noticed in my introduction, when Clev was first published not so long ago, there was more shock at the use of language than at the relationship described. Just a few years later, uh, the publication of uh, Springer has consent has been a cultural phenomenon. 
Uh, while this certainly shows a huge, a huge impact um, Me Too had in France and continues to have with more recent hashtags such as uh, Me Too incest recently used by victims, um, it also suggests that this question, um, these questions have been explored by contemporary French women writers in multiple ways, in ambiguous ways, before Me Too, paving the way um, for women's voices to be heard. Uh, and they've never been so loud. Thank you very much uh, for listening. Thank you so much, Dominique. That was a great way of continuing our thinking about consent and violence and all of the issues that was, were raised by Douglas in the first paper. Thank you so much. Uh, and our next speaker for this panel is Marnie Appleton, who is a postgraduate researcher in creative critical writing in the University of East Anglia, where she also teaches. Her PhD project comprises a collection of short stories exploring contemporary girlhood and a critical component that explores feminist and post-feminist feeling in contemporary short stories about young women and girls. Her short stories have been published in journals such as Banshee and The Tangerine, among others. So, Marnie, it's over to you if you want to share your slide. Take it away. Thank you. Okay, there we go. Um, yeah, so in my PhD uh, research more broadly, I look at the way the short story is being used by women writers to explore the complicated and contradictory nature of contemporary feminisms through narratives about girlhood and young womanhood. The short story's brevity, its ability to focus on one moment and its ability to foster ambiguity, such as through an inconclusive ending, means it is ideally suited to pose questions about our contemporary moment. Writers such as Abigail Ullman and Jenny Zhang, among many others, utilised the short story's formal features to explore the negotiation of effective tensions and to channel the slow, non-cathartic feelings that emerge from the effective regulation of neoliberal femininity. Today, I'll be thinking through empty empowerment, which I use to describe a particularly alienating feeling that emerges when the rhetoric of feminine empowerment comes up against the persistent reality of gender inequality. Girls are told that they can do anything and that girls have never had it so good, but this becomes a kind of pressure in which girls must take advantage of all the opportunities and freedoms they supposedly have. As Sarah Ahmed has observed, sometimes the repetition of good sentiment becomes oppressive. The girl is a particularly emotive site of contradictions in late capitalist societies. She is criticised, celebrated, worried over and watched. She is at once the capable, can-do figure of girl power and the vulnerable figure of the girl at risk. Girls' understanding of themselves is primarily fostered through post-feminist media, where the ideal girl is presented as confident and capable, and in the realm of sex she is knowledgeable both about her own desire and sex in general. She is not presented as a passive object of the male gaze, but rather a self-sexualizing subject. The overly triumphant celebration of girl power obscures and denies the ways in which girls continue to lack power and the ways in which their performances of power have punitive effects, um, such as being um, shamed or putting themselves in dangerous and uncomfortable situations. How can girls talk about difficult or ambivalent feelings and experiences if they are compelled to present themselves as only capable and positive? As Rosalind Gill and Shani Orgad put it, if confidence is the new sexy, then insecurity is the new ugly. A key question for this paper then is to do with the kinds of feelings that become covered up by performances of empowerment. What feelings and experiences become unspeakable when a girl is trying to avoid showing vulnerability and instead embody power and confidence at all costs? Each of the stories I'm discussing today centers on a pair of best friends. The Empty, The Empty, The Empty by Jenny Zhang is told through the first person perspective of Lucy, a nine-year-old Chinese-American girl who lives in Brooklyn, New York. Lucy's best friend is Francine, a black Hispanic girl in her class at school. Throughout the story, we see the push and pull of Lucy's ambivalent attitude towards sex. On the one hand, she wants to be seen as attractive and confident, and she enjoys having a boyfriend as the symbol of her desirability and her grown-upness. Yet when Francine tries to convince Lucy to have sex with her boyfriend, she panics. She does not want to have sex, which is, you know, of course, she's only nine, but yet she struggles to articulate this to Francine. As girls of colour from immigrant families who attend inner city school, they are situated as at risk, quite literally by a sex education expert who visits the school and tells them so. 
She spoke to us spitefully as if we were awful, terrible children and used the word at risk several times without going into detail. What were we at risk for? Lucy certainly doesn't see herself as at risk. She strives to distance herself from what she perceives to be the weakness of vulnerability by showcasing instead the ways that she conforms to the ideal can-do girl by being positive, go-getting, and of course, sexy. In Abigail Ullman's story, Head to Toe, the best friends are Jenny and Elise, 16-year-old white middle-class Australian girls who decide to return to the horse camp they attended as much younger children. This longing to return to the site of childhood innocence, seen through the rosy glow of nostalgia, is a privilege, and it suggests that the girls are beginning to feel a new, a dawning sense of power, powerlessness in the new, almost adult world in which they find themselves, a world which had previously always seemed completely accessible to them. In comparison to Lucy and Francine, whose socioeconomic position limits and frustrates them, Jenny and Elise possess much more financial freedom and the associated privileges that brings, which we see playing out in the realm of the family as both girls' parents bend over backwards to accommodate their every whim. Yet the desire to present themselves as empowered remains a strong pressure in both stories, particularly in regard to sex. The inability to communicate properly in the face of this pressure leads both sets of friends into dangerous and unspeakable situations. So how does growing up in a culture marked by neoliberal post-feminist sensibility affect how the girls relate to one another? Well, they face contradictory imperatives. They must at once strive for individual attention to be the best and to stand out among their friends, yet also conform to and reproduce the post-feminist ideal through upholding standards of normative femininity. So two key features are competition between girlfriends and mutual regulation of each other's behaviour as they strive to be at once distinct from each other and also the same. We know that Lucy is striving for attention right from the opening of The Empty, The Empty, The Empty. Quote, I lived, breathed and exuded mind boggling, head spinning, neck craning, heart pounding, ravishing beauty. I was the best looking girl in fourth grade. This opening makes use of hyperbolic language for humorous effect and to emphasize Lucy's youth. Yet it also points to the competitive and aggressively individualist culture in which Lucy has grown up. Lucy has learned that in order to be seen as valuable, she must shine among her girlfriends, an anxiety that is repeated throughout the story. Lucy's focus on herself keeps her alienated from her friends. She's in competition with Francine, yet this rivalry must remain unspoken to maintain the image of the prized and idealized friendship, the best friendship. Akani Kanai argues that the essentialized figure of the best friend is rich in intertextual and effective significance because she is tied to discourses about individuality, friendship and heterosexuality that instate particular forms of feminine experience as luminous and generalizable. Having a best friend is a privileged position in girl culture. A girl who has a best friend is recognized as one who is accepted, one who belongs. Best friendships both secure a girl's attachment to normative girlhood and protect against the threat of becoming the other. The other is a girl who does not belong. Frangi, a character who is a difficult home life and has been taken in by Lucy's mother is situated as the other in the empty, the empty, the empty. Positioning her in such a way strengthens the bonds between Lucy and Francine. She is seen as weak, alone and rejected in comparison to their strength, unity and belonging. Through their treatment of Frangi, we see how Lucy and Francine have absorbed the post-feminist and neoliberal disgust of vulnerability. We see Frangi through Lucy's eyes as, quote, someone who made everything worse, someone who was so helpless that she sucked the energy and life out of people who had to look after her. Lucy fears that she might come, become or be like Frangi, quote, no way was I going to be a Frangi, no way was I going to be a hangers-on. This vehement rejection of Frangi points towards Lucy's own anxieties around vulnerability, victimhood and unbelonging. In contrast to the emotionally direct first person narrative style of the empty, the empty, the empty, Head to Toe is more lethargic, opening with a comparison of the two protagonists' experiences with sex and drugs. Elise and Jenny lost their virginity at 12 and 13, respectively, but they were nine months apart in age, so it happened for both of them around the same time. Both of them had tried MDMA, coke, speed and mushrooms. Jenny had also taken acid. Elise had once snorted Keta. We can see how the girls' experiments in these areas are seen as achievements and that the girls are constantly measuring themselves against each other. 
However, the feelings typically associated with competition, such as envy, are not present in the text. The dispassionate list establishes an effective tone of boredom and disinterest that continues throughout the story. The rivalry between the friends seems to have, seems to have lost its power. The girls are, quote, bored and sluggish and have the glazed, lethargic and agreeable disposition of jet lag travellers. This suggests that the girls have become disillusioned with the competition and regulation of post-feminism. The anxiety around sameness works to stabilise them as they attempt to detach themselves from the restrictions of neoliberal girlhood in which forward progress and growing up are preferable towards taking a turn back. Even when given an opportunity to stand out when a boy tells Elise she is more attractive than Jenny, she denies it, insisting, quote, we're both exactly the same level of hotness. Can I describe this anxiety as related to a utopia of sameness, an idea that draws on Lauren Berlant's concept, concept of intimate publics? Berlant argued that women's culture in the US claimed to express the desires of all women, though it primarily operated through the circulation of writing by bourgeois white women. The emotional sameness of women that women's culture purported to capture was a fantasy, which could only deliver for certain women. The projection of sameness might create a sense of unity in the culture of post-feminist girlhood, yet in doing so, it also obscures the differences between girls. This helps to maintain normative standards of girlhood and exclude girls who don't conform as the other. As both Balant and Ahmed have pointed out, a life of heteronormative conventionality is often associated with the promise of the good life or the promise of happiness. Even when they feel effectively alienated from each other, girl, girls remain stuck together by a desire to belong and the belief that belonging will bring with it happiness. The similarity shown between Jenny and Elise seems to be a substitute for emotional closeness rather than a way towards it. Despite their strange sluggishness at the start of the story, neither girl shares with her friend why she feels so fed up and over everything, which leaves the reader equally in the dark. At the end of the story, Elise has sex with a boy named Zach, an experience that she describes to Jenny later as, quote, pretty vanilla, which means unexciting, normal, conventional or boring sex. Yet as readers, we know that the experience was more problematic or at least ambivalent. Zach tries to pressure Elise into anal sex and he inserts his finger into her anus whilst acknowledging that it is uncomfortable for her and she doesn't like it. He chokes her and grabs her hair without asking and he speaks to her using violent language during sex, in many ways treating her like an object, using language reminiscent of bad pornography, though this is alternated with a friendliness that he shows her when they are not having sex. The fact that Elise brushes this off as normal is telling. Rosalind Gill suggests that performing the role of the typical heterosexual male fantasy is a condition for which women and girls are granted agency in post-feminist cultures. So for Elise, her ability to be the powerful, independent figure of post-feminism is contingent upon putting up with this kind of treatment from a sexual partner. She is unable to discuss the details of her experience with Jenny, her best friend, because revealing her own discomfort and, and objectification would be shameful. Not only would it reduce Elise's social value by distancing her from the ideal of the confident, sexually knowing subject, but it would also involve admitting her own complicity in her objectification, since empowerment is framed as an entirely personal choice separate from the power structures and dynamics of society. Normative fem femininity is also upheld through mutual regulation. In The Empty, The Empty, The Empty, Francine encourages Lucy to develop her sexual identity, to, prevent, to present herself as an up-for-it, active, desiring sexual subject. However, Francine isn't only encouraging. At certain points, she verges on critical, writing in a note to Lucy, quote, why haven't you done it yet, meaning sex. In post-feminist girl friendships, this often mean sexual regulation is glossed through care and friendship. When Francine suggests that Lucy ought to have sex with her boyfriend, Jason, this makes Lucy, quote, wish she knew how to drive a bus so I could ram it into Jason, ideally dis disabling his penis, but leaving him alive. This quote shows how Lucy cannot even imagine the possibility of telling Francine how she feels. The thought is so shameful, so impossible that she would rather think about causing grave injury than admitting that she doesn't want to have sex. Yet Lucy in turn is also very critical of Francine's behavior. When Francine comes into school with makeup on, Lucy tells her that she looks, quote, very dumb. This is partly an indication of Lucy's jealousy. She feels shame that she doesn't belong in the adult world of sexualization that she perceives Francine to be a part of. 
To Lucy, Francine's sexy self-display constitutes a site of empowerment and pleasure. Yet there is an irony at work here. The reader is aware that what Lucy perceives to be grown up might actually be a sign of abuse. For example, when another friend asks Lucy and Francine who has done it, meaning sex, Francine, quote, jokingly wiggled her hand and Lucy smacks her hand down, believing that Francine is lying. Lucy cannot understand Francine except in relation to herself through the lens of competition. The story holds open the possibility that Francine is telling the truth about having had sex, that she is the victim of sexual abuse, but she is unable to communicate with Lucy about this as harm or suffering. So instead uses the experience to position herself as sexually knowing, a transformation that situates her as powerful rather than a victim. In the shocking final scene of The Empty, The Empty, The Empty, Francine's regulation becomes abusive. She tries to force Lucy into having sex with Jason, and when Lucy resists, she forces Frangie instead. Instead of intervening and protecting Frangie, Lucy becomes stuck. She retreats into herself and feels, quote, a deep disappointment in myself that when I looked at Frangie, I could only picture myself. She remains self-interested, governed by the fear that she could be Frangie, and as such, she is unable to act decisively to intervene and protect Frangie from harm. In this scene, Francine embodies power. She is the one in charge, calling the shots, controlling everything. Yet the power here is no longer situated as something desirable and inherently positive. Instead, it becomes something to fear, something aggressive, which makes the scene unintelligible to Lucy. She is frozen, trapped between the effective confines of post-feminism. We can see how the strict regulation of girls' feelings leads to a space of impasse in which feelings become dysphoric, confusing and incommunicable, and in which there seems to be no correct or acceptable way to be. In contrast, at the end of Head to Toe, Jenny and Elise phone Elise's mum to collect them from the party after they realise they might have to wait a long time for the bus. Though this is potentially an effectively underwhelming scene, the fact that the girls have been returned to the same place the story started with little change, despite their attempt to break away, suggests that they too are feeling a sense of entrapment. Thus, the flat affect of the story might be read not as boredom, but as disillusionment or exhaustion with the relentless performances required of them. Both stories then work structurally as well as thematically to suggest that empty empowerment is effectively limiting. Reading both stories together offers us an interesting perspective on the intersections between race, privilege and the sexualization of girls. But what both stories do individually is highlight the role that empty empowerment plays in alienating girl girlfriends from each other and asks us to think beyond the end of these individual stories to consider what girls might lose in the pursuit of the post-feminist ideal. Thank you. Thank you so much for making us think even more and bringing these two short stories to us. That was brilliant. And what a fantastic panel to get us started. So thank you so much, everybody. And it's now over to you. Any questions from the audience? As we said, feel free to put your hand up um, on camera or virtual hand, or if you'd prefer, just in the chat. Um, could, I, could I start some drives as now? Um, of course, go for it. Yes, thank you very much. Um, well, thank you to, to Douglas and Marnie for their excellent presentations. Uh, my first question is for Douglas, uh, and it's about, and I really liked what you said about querying Matsnev um, and the potential homophobia, which is involved in the, in the backlash. Uh, so, of course, in Springer has text, she does mention the fact that he uh, has sex with um, little boys in the Philippines, paying them, so it's a double um, <clears throat> um, exploitation of, of, of sexual violence and um, the exploitation of their poverty. But I was wondering, since you work on his um, on his sex, which I've never read, so if, if there was um, an exploration of... of um, if there were more positive explorations of uh, homosexual relationships in his in his writing, um, yeah, <laughs> uh, sort of complicated, I suppose. I mean, he, as as you 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 may well have read, if you haven't read the text uh, you may have read the quotation that in his notorious book uh, les moines de saison 
um, he says that um, he considers children or, or he considers the under 16s to be a kind of third third sex basically or third gender and that he doesn't consider himself to be bisexual but to be uh, above all attracted to young people um but i mean i think something that's quite noticeable if you if you read a lot of Matsnev, uh and especially if you sort of read it in chronological order is that um he was in his early writing he could he could very easily be taken as a queer writer he's, he's clearly um the the role of of boys and on kind of sex with young men was had a much bigger place in his life when he was uh younger and in in some ways the the way that he um positions him his own identity as a kind of out sexual outlaw um i think partly stems from that sense of being a kind of queer basically uh in in relation to straight society um and that gradually disappears as he as he's just saying just have more relationships with uh girls and women and he becomes a very kind of then promiscuous uh heterosexual um but i mean throughout his life he had um he has had uh kind of close relationships and um uh, uh, sort of pr- friendships and professional relationships with um, high-profile uh, queer authors and, and publishers, people like uh, Guillaume Canguem and um, René Scherer, uh, with whom he has a, th- a kind of meeting of minds, I think, um, as well as, you know, sharing some of their proclivities. Um, so, yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah, that's thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Yeah, go for it, Alex. Um, me? Um, uh, no, I'll, I'll, I'll go. I have a question for uh, for Marnie. Hi, Marnie. Um, as uh, as Marnie knows, uh, I'm I'm interested in in short stories as well, and and there was one part of uh, her presentation where she mentioned that her research sort of like um, explores issues of um, just like how the short story as a form might be conductive to certain aspects of like feminism and like gender issues. And uh, obviously because in your presentation, you focus particularly on two stories. I wondered if you could just expand a bit on like more like the general claims that you have been finding in, in your research regarding the relationship between form and, and gender or feminism. Yeah, sure. So um, I think one thing that I'm noticing through my readings of these stories that are sort of set in a post-recessionary kind of time um, or written and published in a kind of post-recessionary time is that the feelings that are present in the stories are very like muted. There's quite a lot of flat feelings going on there. Um in response to kind of these, the effective contradictions that I outlined in my paper. And the short story I've found has been a really good or useful form that for writers to explore these feelings because it's able to do certain things within its short parameters. So for example, you can't have, or it's a lot less successful to have an ambiguous ending in a novel which needs to be kind of more wrapped up and the short story enables difficult feelings to exist that wouldn't be sustainable over the length of a novel so feelings like the kind of boredom that I was speaking about or what initially seems to be boredom in head to toe would become quite dull over the length of a novel but the short story is able to explore it um And also through focusing on an individual moment in such detail, which I think the short story is kind of uniquely able to do. Um, But yeah, I think short forms in general are, I'm sort of noticing that they're able to bring together these complicated feelings through like a snapshot image of something, which I think isn't, yeah, necessarily something that's as successful through a long form. So I hope that answers your question a little bit. (laughs) Yeah, thank you. Definitely a lot of things to think about. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Dina, go for it. Hi, uh, I have a question uh, for Douglas. 
um, it's not something very complex. So I was wondering if you had any thoughts on the the marketing of the book within the Anglophone sphere, because we either have it being sold as a memoir of stolen adolescence or just simply memoir. Um, and I want to um, know if you had any thoughts on the insistence of the publishers to inscribe it within the the memoir boom. And it's really interesting that it has only, it's a, it's a one word title and that tends to sell uh, for memoirs. So I wondered if you have hmm. any, any thoughts about that. Um, yeah, uh, no, no very coherent thoughts, I'm afraid. Um, I suppose, I mean, the obvious point to make, I think, is that uh, in the English speaking world, basically nobody had heard of Gabriel Matzneff uh, prior to the publication of Consent. And I say that with some authority because um, I remember speaking to uh, academic colleagues in French studies working on contemporary French literature uh, like a couple of years ago. Uh, before the scandal broke, and none of them had heard of Gabriel Meslev. So you know, I don't think the general public had heard of him, certainly. Um, so, you know, in, in France, the book was very much marketed around that scandal. And, you know, um, even if I suspect very few people had read Gabriel Meslev, um, he was a kind of known figure in the publishing world. And so, um, uh, it, you know, it was it was it was part of that whole um part of that whole scandal uh that that didn't have very much meaning i think in the english speaking world so it had to be the book had to be marketed in a different way hence um uh sort of relating it to a popular genre of the abuse memoir um i do think that's slightly misleading maybe because i think it's a it's a it's a more in some ways subtle or complicated account than that um yeah <laughs> that's kind of all i've got so far it's not, it's not a very um yeah that, that's very useful it's interesting they dropped the article as well so hmm. but i guess it would sound it sounds differently in english but yeah it seems that there will be books that have a one catchy okay. word yeah, yeah. What what are some of the other examples that you're thinking of? Um, educated. Oh yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks. Adina. I have never heard of Gabriel Metznik before, so either I have to say. Should we take Roberta and then Catherine? Roberta, if you want to unmute yourself. I'm, yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm not going to turn my camera on yet. <laughs> no worries. Just unmuting. Um, I've actually got it really, not maybe such a question, possibly more of a comment for, for Marnie. Um, and I'm talking about a lot of similar issues this afternoon. So very, very interested in your paper. Um, and I was wondering, uh, listening to your answer to the last question about short form narratives, um, I've looked at slightly longer memoirs, but generally compared to kind of full length novels, they're, they're still pretty, you know, pretty, um, uh, pretty sort of truncated. And I was wondering, you know, you were saying that the kind of positive thing about that is that because they're very kind of psychologically, emotionally focused, often on maybe one or two characters, you couldn't really sustain that over a, a longer period. And I think that that's probably true. Um, but I was also wondering whether the the problem with that, and it's really a sort of ongoing problem with sort of modernist and, and neo-modernist fiction, is that it leaves the reader to do quite a lot of interpretive work in terms of um, understanding those short stories and, and sort of relatively short novels in relation to the kind of issues that you've raised about post-feminism, um, uh, austerity culture, um, and generally the kind of um, critique of post-modern, sorry, post-feminist neoliberal attitudes to young women's femininity and sexual development in particular. Um, yeah, thank you uh, for your question. 
I think that's true that they they are le uh, leaving the reader to do more work, but I think that's perhaps necessary because to avoid kind of being moralizing maybe because I think that within this kind of um post feminist neoliberal discourse there's like um it's quite um uh, like binary like either things are really positive or they're really bad which I sort of touched on with the figures of the can do girl and the at risk girl yeah so it's quite difficult to um find the kind of way through that without being seen as you know kind of categorized as like maybe an anti-sex prude or like um a slut or whatever they, they these things are very it's, yeah they're very one or the other so I wonder whether maybe that's the reason that the short story and the short forms are working so well because by leaving it on an open basis they avoid being kind of forced to into conclusivity that is maybe necessary in a longer longer work yeah, I, I, I think you're probably right. I think you're probably right. Um, I think the problem, though, um, might be that it just seems like a kind of continuum of women's kind of negative, <laughs> negative memoirs. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, whereas I think there is something quite specific about, about this moment. Um, but I wonder, particularly with younger women reading that, whether they won't maybe have that sense of that, that this is... There is a kind of particular set of of constraints and feminist issues that these texts are responding to. Yeah, I think there's definitely um, like a danger of these things becoming of it seeming like hopeless, which is something that I have been thinking about. That if there's no conclusion, it might feel like both stories do kind of end on quite a um, like a negative note. Like you don't feel mm. particularly uplifted at the end or anything I do think that's the point but I think that these stories because of how kind of you know writing and publishing works that they are speaking to a moment that we are like uh, the post-feminist moment is kind of not behind us but it's now yeah, yeah. now seeing like an increase in feminist activism again yeah so yeah yeah I wonder whether th things will will change and how they'll change but yeah I'm interested to see sort of as the the publication of stories goes on what how things will change as they go on <laughs> yeah 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 no I, I totally agree I totally agree and I think it is a very specific reaction against post-feminism mm. and a particular kind of neoliberal positivism mm. about sexuality and women's identities exactly yeah so thank you anyway very interesting <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much Catherine Sorry, I can hear me now, but my video doesn't want to turn on for some reason. That's a little bit worrying. <laughs> can you hear me anyway? Yeah. Oh, is the video working now? My computer's playing up. It is, is now. It yeah, you, okay. I'm slightly, I was just worried about the rest of the conference if I can't even appear. Okay, brilliant. Well, thank you for the three papers. I really enjoyed them. Um, just a couple of points to all of you, really. The first one is that the texts are just so uncomfortable, aren't they? Like, I was all the way through, I was feeling incredibly kind of, almost invaded by the descriptions and, and really deeply, all three actually felt really uncomfortable. That was the first thing I want to say. And I just think it's a really great challenging start. Um, the second thing, which maybe makes what I said first sound a bit dodgy is that I, I'm kind of adding to my Amazon wish list and I've got this <laughs> video that I'm going to spend the conference like with a list and, and end up spending a lot of money. Anyway, I do have a question for that and it's from Marnie. Um, I don't know the text at all. Um, and I really like the concept of emptiness. Um, at one point, you did also refer to characters being exhausted or worn out or something like that. And I just wondered if, if that was something, sorry, that's my, my calendar making a noise, if that's something different from emptiness completely or whether it's it's connected to it or whether they're, they're kind of the same. I don't know if you, if you can elaborate on that or if I'm making any sense. Yeah, um, thanks. That's a really interesting question. Um, I guess I kind of see them as in a similar kind of umbrella term of the, these feelings that are like necessarily kind of slow um, and don't really go anywhere or maybe do anything. They're kind of just like feeling tired, feeling fed up, feeling um, stuck, feeling empty. They're kind of, they're not directed towards any sort of change. They're kind of, um, yeah, they're just static or very stuck in one place. So I think in that sense, I think that um, 
emptiness is the is similar to um the kind of exhaustion but then i think that the thing about emptiness is that it is the hollowing out of empowerment it's the kind of the experience of having the word empowerment not really doing the work that we expect of it like be it the being told that you're empowered when the actual lived experience is very different i think that creates a and also i, th I think it's a confusing and difficult feeling because how how can you speak about that if the word is being used to do something entirely different um so yeah i hope that Oh, no, a little bit. <laughs> no I, I think it's a great description of, of teenage girls actually um I'm not going to speak about teenage boys I don't have any but I do have a teenage girls but it, it really did speak to me I think it, it, it really works as a concept so thank you oh thank you hmm. any other questions I do have a few prepared if I don't want to take time from the audience I'll launch in it and maybe it'll be a springboard. Uh, my question is actually sort of inspired by, by Dominique's paper, but it's a question to everybody. Um, Clev is a text I know probably the best out of all of the ones uh, presented. And my question is, where are the adults in the stories that you've looked at? And I don't mean the adults, the case of uh, Matzneff or the case of Monsieur Biot, but the other adults, right? Family or maybe teachers or sort of the surrounding adults. So how are they presented in the text that you look at and specifically in relation to these issues of consent, violence, vulnerability? Um, I can I can start um, if that's okay with everyone. Uh, where the adults are really absent, uh, I would say that in the background, uh, in the case of Darius Sek, uh, there's another scene actually I presented on on the text last week, and um, and someone in the audience noted that it was her dad taking her to the pharmacy when she has her first period. So there are moments, uh, glimpses, I would say, where they are here. Uh, but most of the time, they seem to be uh, completely absent. And in the case of uh, Springora, so her dad leaves um, the family. Um, so he is, is very, um, very absent figure. But her mom um, was, was raising her. So and there are very sweet scenes between them of of um, of, of love and and um, complicity. But. Um, I would say that she's, she enables really the relationship. And I think, well, Douglas can perhaps uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I do think that when she tries to break up with, with him or mentions the fact that she wants to leave my staff, uh, the mom says, oh, poor thing, he's going to be devastated. So there's a, a very uh, odd mix of um, absence and enabling um, that seems to be taking place in that particular uh, moment in time, and in a quite a bohemian um, lifestyle for Springoha, um, and to some extent um, described in, in Clev as, as well. Yeah, um, I, I, it's a very, Le Consentement is a very damning portrait really of um, the adult society of in France in the 1980s in terms of protecting children, um, because in addition to her parents, all these kind of peripheral figures uh, are, are also essentially kind of enablers. Um, so, you know, at one point the, the police are uh, investigate the relationship, but they, you know, they don't try very hard and they, and, you know, Matsnev just kind of charms them and they sort of laugh it off. And, um, there are points where she goes to, so she goes to talk to uh, the philosopher Emile Sioran, who is a friend of Matzneff's, um, and when she's in kind of great distress and their relationship is is sort of, you know, come unraveling basically, and he tells her how uh, she should be honoured to be uh, in a relationship with a great artist like Gabriel Matzneff, and you know, obviously clearly gives no kind of um, shows no understanding whatsoever for the particularity of her situation. Um, and there are these kind of really uh, creepy scenes where um, her mother's boyfriend, is it, um, basically kind of makes a pass at the young Vanessa, assuming that if she's in a relationship with an older man, she must be, you know, easy and therefore open to other relationships and or other sexual experiences with older men. Um, so, yeah, it's just it's a very kind of jamming portrait. And, and likewise, her teachers um, seem more inclined to 
well, again, either either they come on to her or they're more inclined to punish her for what they see as delinquent behavior rather than uh, her being, um, uh, uh, you know, it trapped in this situation that she, that, you know, is kind of, she's got herself into without fully understanding what it was, basically. Uh, yeah, um, so I think in the two stories that I spoke about, the um, adults actually, uh, it's quite interesting um, to compare the difference between the two stories. So in the Jenny Zhang uh, story, the empty, the empty, the empty, Lucy is, um, she's quite desperate for her parents' affection, but they're not around very much because they have to um, work and things like that. So there's, like, I think there's one moment when she speaks about um, the sex education at the school where they talk about unwanted touch and she says she's confused because she hadn't had enough touch in her life to split it off into categories of wanted and unwanted which is kind of telling in the way that she feels like she's deprived of um, maybe affection a little bit um, and then in the empty the empty the em um, sorry in head to toe the other story the Abigail Ullman one the parents are around all the time and they're constantly indulging the girls. Um, so there's like a scene where they want to go shopping and they just give them their credit cards. They want to go to the cinema and they watch four films in a row. So it's like real kind of indulgence for, for their part. But the girls can't speak to them either. There's still this like barrier between them in that they seem, they take them to these parties, but they have no idea presumably what's going on. And communication between the girls and the parents in both stories is uh, made difficult because the parents are critical and the girls obviously take that um, to heart quite strongly. So, yeah, there's this kind of that when they are there, they're still unable to speak to each other. Thank you so much. We still got a few more minutes for questions so plenty of food for thought there um i just want to say it's not a question really or a comment um uh just to say that uh, i thought dominic and, and mani's papers were, were really good and um i thought the, the panel worked really well together so thanks very much edina and uh, sandra for, for putting us together um and dominic was saying talking about um in relation to Clev and Le Consentiment, uh, what she called the normalization of sexual relations between adults and teenagers in the 1980s. Um, but what's very clear from listening to Mani's paper is that um, the sexualization of, of children uh, has <laughs> absolutely not gone away, you know, au contraire. Um, so, um, yeah, just that, you know, nothing, nothing more, Nothing really more concrete than that to say, except that uh, I thought they, it's very thought provoking um, uh, bringing together of the papers. So thanks very much. Just a, a comment on that. I find it very interesting how the sexualization of children is evolving in, in the public sphere, because I was in the Jardin de Luxembourg a few months ago, and there was a sign uh, where the, the playground was and said, you cannot take pictures of the children. So no, no, pas de photo uh, here. And in the UK, of course, you have the playgrounds where you're not supposed to be, to enter if you're not accompanied by a child, which is an interesting reversal of not, of the children being accompanied by adults and adults being accompanied by children. So I, uh, it's a, a personal project of mine. I like to see, to look at um, signs on streets or, or in institutions and see what's forbidden to figure out what kind of behaviors people actually um, have. So it's interesting how it's evolving now um, in the public sphere as well. But if I can just jump on that. Firstly, I totally want to echo uh, Douglas's uh, words. So thank you. Thank you very much, um, both of you and Marnie and Douglas too. Uh, but um, related to what you were just saying, um, Adina, uh, just before the publication of Springer's text, uh, which led to uh, introducing an age of consent um, in, 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 in French law, um, a relationship, there was a trial and a relationship between a 28 year old and an 11 year old was um, judged to be consensual in France in, in 2020. So, 
Um, and so you said at the same time we can't take pictures um, in the in the park, but there seem to be uh, indeed not just in in literary fiction, but um, in our culture, um, a very very complicated and problematic relationship um, between um, well, two two children, and not just teenagers, but also uh, very young children. So um, and I think there's a texts. Uh, we discussed today really um, really show that uh, that it's a um, a long process, but a very very um, contemporary one as well. It was also very interesting because it was Jardin de Luxembourg, which is the excellence, you know, the the playground of the rich. So um, that that was also interesting. But yeah, there was a very famous case a few years ago that um, was in the papers in the U.S. as well about about consent or so was it the 11 year old that had, so to speak, a, a consensual relationship with someone much older um, or so the French law said. So it, it's the, the law is evolving a little bit, but we'll see if everything else evolves with it as well. But then as, and then as Douglas said, it also raises um, other problems with carceral um, feminism is not necessarily the answer to um, to these these questions but um, but yes certainly an interesting um, unfolding of events taking place that's brilliant and I love it when all of, when you, we get sort of discussions uh, going we still have a couple of minutes so if there's any burning questions then please use this opportunity. Um, if not, I'm just wondering whether people would like a three minute comfort break just for an extra tactical cup of tea or, or coffee. But before we do that, can you just join me in saying thank you to Dominique Douglas and Marnie for these fantastic papers and feel free to unmute yourself and give them a big clap as well or use the virtual clap. So thank you so much for getting us started and we'll kick off with panel number two at 10 o'clock. So a three minute, three, three, two minute comfort break and then we'll see you here. I will start right on time. So our second panel of today uh, is entitled on female being, ambiguous selfhood and vulnerability. So we will be starting off with Emanuela Buscemi from the University of Monterey. We'll be presenting a paper entitled The Antimonumenta uh, Vivas Nos Queremos, Artistic Interventions, the Politics of Vulnerability and Activism Against Femicides in Mexico. So. Um, I'm trying to find, yes, so Emanuela Buscemi holds a PhD in sociology from the University of Aberdeen in Scotland, and she now teaches at the University of Monterey in Mexico. She previously taught at the American University of Kuwait, and her research interests include alternative social movements, feminist activism, um, informal activism and resistance, identity and gender and politics, performance agency and belonging in the Arabian Gulf and Latin America. Her work has been featured in um, the Journal of Middle East Women's Studies, Contemporary Social Science, About Gender, International Journal of Gender Studies, Democratization, as well as in edited volumes published by NYU Press, Rutledge, uh, Peter Lang, and Hargrave Macmillan. She is the co-author with Ildiko Kaposi um, of the edited volume, Everyday Youth Practices in the Gulf Peninsula, Challenges and Challenges, and it came out in 2021. So over to you, Emanuela. Thank you so much. So I'll start sharing my, <coughs> sorry, my presentation. Uh, can you see that? Okay, great. Please let me know when the time is up. Okay. <laughs> so um, thank you so much. First of all, I would like to thank uh, the organizers, Sandra and Adina. You have been so nice and so patient, <laughs> really. Uh, so thank you for putting together such an interesting and impressive conference, and I am really humbled and happy to be a part of it. Uh, as was anticipated, this is the title of my, uh, of my paper, quite a mouthful, I know. <laughs> the Antimonumenta Vivas Nos Queremos, Artistic Interventions, the Politics of Vulnerability and Activism Against Feminicide feminicides in Mexico. It was actually longer, so this is a shorter version. <laughs> okay, um, so 
this paper forms part uh, of an ongoing research, uh, sorry, of an ongoing research project on Mexican and more broadly uh, Latin American feminisms in the plural that I have been conducting in the past few years. It lies at the intersection between social movements, agency, resistance and activism, decoloniality, memory and the urban space. In the context of this presentation, I uh, situate women's writing at the intersection of performance and creative spaces, as well as digital activism. Um, on September 25, 2021, uh, in Mexico City, feminist activists reclaim a central roundabout previously dedicated to Christopher Columbus. The statue uh, had been removed by the municipality to be restored. Well, restored. <laughs> Um, amid concerns that the monument would be destroyed ahead of the commemoration of the Columbus Day. <clears throat> Sorry, as Mexican activists joined a movement across the Americas to topple down monuments symbolizing racism and colonial violence. A year after it was removed, the mayor uh, of Mexico City, the woman, announced that the Columbus statue would be replaced with a replica of a pre-colonial statue of an indigenous woman named La Mujer de Amahac, the woman from Amahac. The government framed this as a response to strong critiques from indigenous communities and artists who rejected an initial proposal of an Olmec indigenous head designed by a non-indigenous male artist who was chosen through a process that did, did not guarantee consultation nor transparency. The new proposal was interpreted by activists as reproducing the often violent ways in which um, the coloniality of power is still prevalent in the institutions and the overall design of the government, which the state has appropriated to symbols either for folklore or as tokenism uh, and displace them in public spaces without addressing the conditions of inequality and exclusion faced by indigenous communities. In the context of this ongoing debate, feminist activists reclaimed the roundabout and the monument and proclaimed it an anti-monument, but they framed it in the feminine, anti-monumenta. Um, as a site of vindication and resistance. This is the Facebook page of, uh, of the group, the, the informal collective of groups. Um, <coughs> sorry. Uh, the anti statue uh, represents a silhouetted woman with her first raised, and the word justicia, it's. There is. Okay, no, there was, ah, uh, yes, here you can, you can read it. It's kind of, uh, I don't know, it's kind of in, in the other sense, but you can read Justicia on, on the monument. Um, her first, her fist raised and the word Justicia engraved in it. And the, the, the anti-statue is purple. It is the color that has been the symbol of activism against gender-based violence across Latin America. Artistic interventions at the base of the monument consist in writing the names of desaparecidas, disappeared women, as we can see, uh, this is the park, the garden park slash park that is next to it. And you can see here uh, the names and the pictures. Um, artistic interventions at the base of the monument consist in writing the names of disappeared women and victims of gender-based violence and feminicides. Moreover, in an attempt to correct the institutional violence perpetrated against indigenous and Afro-American women, the feminist activists raise awareness on multiple gender-based forms of oppression. In a statement that they published on their social media, uh, in their pages, uh, like the Facebook page that I showed at the beginning, the group affirmed its, commi its commitment to make this space a symbol of resistance of all the women who have fought and will continue fighting against police repression 
against military crimes, against land removals, against extractionism, against the stealing of water, against patriarchal violence, it's, it's a list of against, <laughs> against feminicides and disappearances, against the intromission of governments and churches on the right to decide on our bodies, against the inaction of corrupt institutions and the corruption of an absent state. So this is the political statement. This exemplifies an ongoing debate about public memory that has intensified in Mexico in a time of widespread violence and human rights abuses. Uh, and particularly since 2006, when uh, the war against the drug cartels uh, began. So over the past, uh, well, 18 years, more, uh, no, 16 years, more than 100,000 people have disappeared. More than 300,000 have been killed. And there has been a steady increase in criminal violence throughout the country. Uh, moreover, um, if we consider this from a gender point of view, 11 women, and these are official data, uh, 11 women are victims of feminicides every day. And this number is higher when we consider the victims of gender-based violence more broadly in Mexico. So even though the monument has been reclaimed multiple times by the municipality, uh, that is ironically led by a woman affiliated with the populist, uh, press, the populist government of President uh, Lopez Obrador, every time the uh, each time the feminist collectives reoccupy um, the anti-monument and the Glorieta, the roundabout, with more vigor and more support from part of the vibrant local civil society and with a stronger campaign on social media. Uh, through artistic and memory activism, feminist militants appropriate the vulnerability of the victims by means of, inter of interventions that aim, among other things, at putting the roundabout on the map of Mexico City and rename it Glorieta de las Mujeres que Luchan, the roundabout of women fighters. So the paper explores uh, these politics of vulnerability that reclaims the voice and the corporality of the victims of gender-based violence and feminicides, among other issues, to enact political and cultural resistance by appropriating personal memories, thus bridging the gap between personal histories on the one hand and official history and collective memory on the other. I address here multiple forms of vulnerability highlighted in this specific case study. First, the, the vulnerability of gender, then sexualized memories in the context of collective public memory, then the vulnerability of women as social and political subjects in Mexico, and uh, then the vulnerability, and then vulnerability as a motive for resistance and mobilization. <clears throat> beginning with the first one, vulnerability of gendered and sexualized memories. Women have been historically underwritten and underrepresented in official history. So, and even when they have been represented, they have been predominantly, uh, this has been done predominantly considering them background figures. And even then, they always represented the upper socioeconomic levels of society that meaning white elite. So this phenomenon has been reflected in the topography of the urban space through the naming of streets, of squares, of airports, and everything that we know, all of which uh, celebrates uh, the lives and deeds of white men, sometimes uh, even symbols of the colonial past. In this case, uh, the monument and uh, the roundabout dedicated to Christoph Christopher Columbus. In this way, symbolically reiterating the production of exclusion, of othering, and of vulnerability. Monuments are forms of remembering and commemorating, and they serve the purpose of depicting and representing a nationalistic, in this case, in the case of Mex Mexico, nationalistic narrative, normally the one underlying imagined communities. Memory itself is vulnerable, and it is highly contexted, as we can see from this case. With respect to, to, to this, sorry, uh, Delano Alonso and Nimas talk about a politics of memory that exemplifies 
the struggle over public memory, a struggle that opposes resistant activists against the institutions and the dominant narrative. The second case, uh, in the way I interpret and I uh, work on vulnerability in this context, is the vulnerability of women as social and political subjects in Mexico. Uh, so I depart here from the consideration of gender as vulnerability and vulnerability as intrinsic to gender. So according to the Cruz and Rao, gender can be explored as a specific form of vulnerability that is often socially and politically embedded within masculine forms of power, even though the potentialities of gender are not fully exhausted by such a framework. Um, they refer in this specific case to sexed vulnerabilities. Vulnerability in this case is the perpetuation of disempowerment. Uh, Marianne Hirsch reminds us that vulnerability is socially, politically, economically, uh, and economically created and differentially imposed. An acknowledgement of vulnerability, both shared and produced, can open a space of interconnection, as well as a platform for responsiveness and resistance. So she invites to think of vulnerability as a radical openness towards surprising uh, possibilities, as a space to work from, as opposed to something only to be overcome. And this brings me to the third conceptualization of vulnerability, third and last, <laughs> uh, the vulnerability as a motive for resistance and mobilization. Uh, so according to the work, uh, the edited volume by Butler, Gambetti, and Subsey, vulnerability is, can be, and is a mobilizing political force, where the body is a relation or an absence that is discursively constructed. The deployment of vulnerability in the patriarchal and paternalistic national, uh, nationalist discourse implies women's impotence, inaction, passivity, and this joins them from resistance. This is based on what the authors describe as the ontological claims about the constitutive vulner vulnerability of women's bodies. Uh, women's vulnerability is thus negatively produced against the backdrop of men's action. The discourse of vulnerability is therefore a discourse of victimization that given the conditions of the majority of Mexican women, turns it into a re-victimization, especially in a context of structural and institutionalized violence, coupled with high levels of impunity and corruption. Um, the, case, uh, the case study of the Glorieta of this roundabout and the anti-monument shows vulnerability as a call for action through embodied resistance, as well as artistic and performative practices that we can see now in the pictures um, that are aimed at reclaiming agency in the commemoration or anti-commemoration of victims of, of gender-based and institutionalized violence. And here, well, I don't think I have the time, but it is interesting to link this, um, this element to um, Mbembe's theorization of necropolitics as um, the version of Foucault's biopolitics from the point of view of the global south. Butler refers to vulnerability in resistance as being exposed and agentic at the same time. So memory and trauma also contribute to resistance and fuel rage and activism. The Cruz and Rao identify violence in fact, as the unifying ground of much of feminist activism, especially in the global South and especially uh, in this time currently in Latin America. So the Glorietta basically subverts the idea of traditional monuments in the public space and memorialization um, through vulnerability is political. In, in this case. So why is this case important? And, and uh, I mean, why should we, how can we open up the debate considering the case of a roundabout in Mexico City? So the, this case study raises a number of questions that intersect vulnerability, citizenship, activism, agency, 
um, agent, sorry, agency and resistance, asymmetrical relations of power, uh, the overlapping forms of oppression um, exemplified by gender, race, class, and sexual orientation, the colonial past and the global south. And it also opens up the debate of uh, on gender, uh, gendered agency and resistance and citizenship, as well as feminist activism. So I think I went very fast, but <laughs> I hope I was within the time because I was worried I would, I would be uh, over time, which is never good. Okay, <laughs> thank you. It was perfect, thank you. So, um, next up. We have Alesh Tuavecina from the University of Glasgow will be presenting a paper entitled Culture of Disclosure, Cat Person, Women's Writing Online and the Ambivalence of Vulnerability. Okay. Um, Alesh is an early career researcher um, teaching at the University of Glasgow. He researches women's writing, short story anthologies and digital literature, topics on which has published several articles. He is a member of the European Network for Short Fiction Research and associate editor of Short Fiction Theory and Practice. Uh, with apologies for having massacred your name, probably uh, it's over to you. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. The name was absolutely fine. So uh, thanks for that introduction uh, and thank you for having me here. Uh, can you see the presentation well? Yeah. Um, excellent. Uh, thank you also for organizing the conference. It has been incredibly interesting um, so far. So I'll just, um, I'll just start. Um, so today I want to talk to you about essentially the online fate of a short story by the American author Kirsten Rupenian called Cat Person. And for those of you, uh, let me see, yeah. For those of you um, who don't know the story, Cat Person is, uh, put simply, the story of a bad date uh, between its protagonist, 20 year old university student named Marco and Robert, a man 14 years her senior. It was published in the New Yorker at the height of the Me Too movement late in 2017, and in a matter of days, it revolutionized the internet by going viral in an unprecedented way for a piece of fiction. Although this is only technically true. And I say this because actually an important particularity of Cat Person's online spread was that many people did not see the story as being fictional at all. Despite its third-person limited narrator, its well-structured plot, the use of many trademark devices of narrative fiction like dialogue or free indirect discourse, an important number of the story's first readers considered the piece an article or a personal essay. In the next 20 minutes or so, I want to explore why this happened and I will offer two complementary explanations. First, I will argue that the story is thematic and the way in which it approaches its content, uh, in, in which it approaches its theme, connects it with a, a tradition of women's storytelling which has long been blurring the lines between fiction and nonfiction. And second, that social media, where the text was primarily circulated, exerted a determinant hybridizing force upon the genre of the story. I will finish by connecting these two threads uh, in order to draw some conclusions about the status of specific forms of women writing online. And in particular, I will suggest that social media offers valuable opportunities, but also pitfalls or problematics for women's expression of their vulnerable experiences. Okay, so let's get started. I have already said that Cat Person tells the story of a bad date between Margot and Robert. To specify a little bit, Margot and Robert go out after a meeting in a cinema where she works on a date that grows increasingly, increasingly awkward as the night advances. Their encounter climaxes, climaxes on a sex scene that straddles the borders of consent, following which Margot decides to ghost Robert as, uh, and, he, uh, and he resorts to insulting her after failing to get her attention back. Now, whatever else it is about, though, I want to begin by highlighting a fact about the story that is seldom noticed, namely its preoccupation with labels and the act of labeling. We can see this from the very title of the text. That person is a stand-in phrase for Robert, which initially serves to classify him as a pet owner. 
Yep. Those of, you, those of you who have read the story will know that the existence of the cats is never confirmed in the text. And so there emerges the possibility of reading the descriptor as a cunning self-branding self strategy devised by Robert to appear more attractive to Margot as the story advances. The story also finishes with a label produced by Robert, although on this occasion, one that is applied, applied to Margot. Or the story's final word is Robert's last message in a string of increasingly accusational texts sent to his love interest. Although different in character, both whore and cat person fulfill a similar function to the extent that they attempt to class and fix the characters within a predetermined identity. In contrast with this, the rest of the text systematically dramatizes Margot's struggle to neatly identify and classify the different situations she lived through with Robert. The protagonist is shown to have difficulties early in the story, for example, categorizing Robert's first kiss, which he finds terrible, shockingly bad, but also in a way tender. And when she tries to describe Robert to her friend Tamara, she tells her, he's a nice guy, sort of, and wondered how true that was. But the apotheosis of the struggle with labeling takes place during their sexual intercourse. In the story's central scene, Margot arrives at an emotional crossroads marked by the sudden revulsion she develops towards her date, her incapacity to withdraw consent due to the feelings of guilt, and her fight to enjoy sex under these circumstances. Even as we get a clear and precise picture of the protagonist's feelings during the coitus, none of these emotions can be accurately named and defies categorization. Once Robert ejaculates, Margaret is shown marveling at herself for a while, this is a quote, at the mystery of this person who just done this bizarre, inexplicable thing. Now, I'm aware that a degree of oversimplification might be involved in schematizing cat person in this way, as somehow being made up from masculine and feminine texts set against each other according to their relationship with labels. However, the possibility of doing so highlights the relationship between Rupenian's text and some key uses of storytelling for women in women's writing tradition. Many feminists have noticed um, um, like Andrea Dworkin in the quotation here, that women have traditionally been starved of the power to name and order the world. As a result of this, women have lacked a conceptual repository with which to fix and express aspects of their own existence, especially those concerning forms of male abuse. This is nicely illustrated in an anecdote collected by the sociolinguist uh, Sherry Scrammery um, in one of the women's groups she organized in the 1980s. There, she recalls, a woman complained about the way her husband systematically evaded dinner making duties by praising her cooking. Cramery writes, she was using a verbal strategy for which she, the woman, had no word and thus had more difficulty identifying and bringing it to his awareness. She told people at the seminar, I had to tell you the whole story to explain how he was using flattery to keep me in my female place. End of quote. Now, some critics like Toril Moy or Sarah Ahmed have noticed that implicit in accounts like this, um, like this one, is a view of narrative, of stories, as a valuable resource for women, especially in the face of terminological restraints. By telling the whole story, women have been able to communicate and share otherwise nameless experiences. Of course, these critics are thinking in non-fictional terms here, but fiction has participated and continues to participate in this endeavor. Recent studies by Helen Taylor, Emma Young, or the presentation from the previous panel from Marnie, um, which I do not have time to go into here, have argued that many women see both reading and writing fiction as a way to learn about and express aspects of their own everyday lives. Most notably, there is a tradition of feminist publications which has long been fostering a porosity between fictional and non-fictional modes of writing. Feminist magazines like the legendary Spare Rip, anthologies like This Bridge Called My Back or Homegirls, and more recently online sites like Room Magazine or Scum, intermingle short stories and poems with reviews, news articles, or live writing, 
Seeing each of these genres as participants in the same projects to give voice and to expose the complex experiences of women, as well as to fix and critique the oppressive aspects of patriarchal structures. We can rethink this history of women's expressive and reading practices by seeing it as the emergence of an interpretative community for whom the distinction between fiction and nonfiction has been weakened. Confronted with the difficulty of naming certain aspects of their lives, many women have seen narrative fiction as yet another tool with which to articulate their realities. In turn, women readers are liable to read these texts as not wholly separate or different from factual accounts and testimonies. With its focus on and particular engagement with the intricacies of modern dating, sex, and female consent, Cat Person speaks directly to this cultural circumstance, and his reception as an essay may be at least partly explained by it. Yet, Noticing, as I have done, the way in which stories in certain magazines, anthologies, and blogs can have their fictional status somewhat hybridized brings me to the second explanation for the reception of Cat Person as an essay I want to offer today, namely the inference of context in the genre of a piece of writing. In a recent collection of essays entitled The Modern Short Story and Magazine Culture, several contributors remark on how the dominant code of a magazine will affect how each of its contents is perceived. To give a simplistic example to get to the gist of it, uh, the gist of their arguments, the humorous aspects of an otherwise serious piece of writing, for example, um, are likely to be foregrounded if the text appears in a, say, satirical publication. I propose that a comparable reading can be applied to the responses of Rupenian's story. As I have already said, Cat Person first appeared on The New Yorker, but it was through social media, especially Twitter, that the story was mainly circulated and where the majority of readers would have encountered it. As some commentators have observed, social media sites are platforms uh, that are dominated by reality-based modes of expression. And this is true in two different ways. To start with, they are the principal means of dissemination of texts published online, whose nature, some studies show, is overwhelmingly non-fictional. News items, informative texts, or personal blogs constitute the fabric of the internet. But more importantly, social media spaces are designed to prompt the disclosure of the subjective and the private through a variety of mechanisms. Dorn Friesen is a scholar in educational technology who has studied this phenomenon in relation to Facebook. He has noticed how the site encourages the generation of life stories by requiring users to complete a profile and encouraging them to post on their timeline by asking what is on your mind. Likewise, he argues that the main function of the different interactions the platform affords, like befriending, following, or liking, is to provide users with, quote, myriad ways of positioning themselves as subjects, end of quote, something that applies to other social media channels besides Facebook. In this sense, a story like Cat Person entering Facebook or Twitter inhabits a context where nonfiction prevails on multiple levels. It is the hegemonic code, and as such, a force liable to affect the generic perception of the piece to the extent that it exerts an influence on the horizon of expectations of the community of readers that participate in those spaces. Although very summarily explained, hopefully through this brief account, people can already begin to see that the context of social media provides us with another possible complementary explanation for the miscategorization of Rupinian's short story. But we can push this line of thought a bit further to make this argument more robust and in turn connected to some of the things I have been claiming in the first part of the paper. Well, it is possible to assimilate the textual space of a social network to a magazine, as I have done. There are also important differences between the two that support what I am arguing. In a magazine, a piece of fictional writing might simply coexist and be influenced by non-fictional texts. But in social media, the spread and indeed the very survival of a story depends on its capacity to associate with the non-fictional elements of these sites. The extent to which a story is visible and succeeds online is directly proportional with its capacity to be employed by users to say something about themselves, to attract the likes, shares, and comments through which people in these sites construct their life narratives. 
This is clearly seen in the case of Kat Persson, whose online transmission was facilitated by a corpus of responses to the text, by users who saw in it opportunities to define their personalities by identifying or disidentifying with the main characters, state views on issues of consent and abuse, and share related personal experiences. And I have included um, some of the tweets here um, in this slide. Implicit in this point that I'm making is the idea that the more a story can be read as real, the likelier it is of going viral. The social media dynamics I have just described suggest that these platforms exert a defictionalizing force on the literary pieces circulating them. But their workings also make clear that a direct proportionality exists between possibilities of reading a fictional story as real life experience and the prospects of it being incorporated in and disseminated through these online spaces. The potential to view characters as thinly veiled real people or social types, or to identify argumentative threats relevant to one's experiences in a story are key aspects enhancing possibilities to be interacted with and integrated into users' profiles. In this sense, the thematic and narratological concerns I saw underlying the meaning of cat person made me thought to underlie also its online success. As I argued, the story is interested in the use of narrative to express the unnamed or unnameable in heterosexual relationships, seeing in fiction a tool to expose and examine uncodified aspects of sexual politics affecting women and their realities. While these attributes connect the piece within a with a tradition of women's writing and reading that blurs the fiction nonfiction divide, I would argue that it also determined the story's digital booming. They offered users clear avenues to connect the fictional world of the story to their world in a way that made the text usable for a range of self-expression operations. On the one hand, it seemed to me that this analysis is good, for, uh, is good news for women's fiction. As a writing and reading tradition particularly well-versed in and with a history of bridging the gap between the imagined and the real, it would seem to have a bright future in the online spaces where mainstream writing and reading are increasingly migrating. The fact that Kat Person is, to this day, the only short story to have gone truly viral attests to this fact. Unfortunately, I want to finish my presentation on a less clearly optimistic note by reflecting on the motives behind what we could call social media's promotion of the real. As we all know by now, social media giants make an important part of their profits by selling users' data to business partners. The depth and dangers of this business came dramatically to light in 2018 with the Cambridge Analytica Facebook scandal, which discovered that Facebook users' data had been sold and used to assist in the political campaigns of Donald Trump and Brexit. While I do not have the time nor expertise to go into details about the dynamics of this and similar phenomena, one thing that is obvious is that social media companies like Facebook or Twitter rely on real information about their customers to generate money. The more and more accurate data these platforms are able to extract, the higher their value. It is unsurprising in this sense that Facebook makes you undergo an identity check when signing up for the platform. Something that Elon Musk seems, think, seems keen to bring to Twitter, even when he finally acquires the company in the name of cybersecurity. A real reason for this, though, seems to me to be the fact that fictional information is of very little use to these enterprises. What is interesting for them is that people disclose who and how they really are or think in order to generate sellable details and statistics. The online performance of a story like Cat Person and what it might mean for women's writing in the digital age looks more ambiguous from this perspective. While its success points to a promising synergy between digital spaces and important female traditions of writing and reading fiction, it also suggests the extent to which this synergy might be complicit with interests of tech companies investing in surveillance capitalism. By directly speaking to problematic issues of women's existence and sparking personalized debates across the board, Cat Person is the kind of cultural artifact that might not just be attractive or adequate, but also profitable for social media companies and their commercial aims. This is all from me today. Thank you very much for listening.
Thank you very much for this really fascinating paper. It's really interesting to hear it from uh, another perspective other than just, just literary. I, I have some thoughts myself on Cat Person. It is my absolute pleasure and honor to introduce to you Dr. Helen Gasalo and Darina Aljundi, who's joining us from the Cannes Film Festival, thanking both of them for agreeing to give the first keynote to our conference. On a personal level, the pleasure is even greater given that Helen's teaching and research and Darina's work, both theatrical and literary, were incredibly influential in my decision to study contemporary women's writing. Helen Vassalo is an academic and translator based in the Department of Modern Languages and Cultures at the University of Exeter in the UK. Her primary research interests are in translated literature and feminism, with a focus on contemporary women's writing and theory. She translates Francophone women's writing with particular focus on North Africa and the Middle East. Most recently, she has translated Darina Jundi's The Day Nina Simone Stopped Singing. So this one. And Marseillaise My Way. This one. Both of them published with Naked Eye Publishing in 2022. Helen is currently working on a translation of selected nonfiction by Prix Goncourt winning author Leila Slimani, The Devil is in the Detail and Other Stories, to be published by Liverpool University Press in 2023. Helen is the founder of Translating Women, an industry-facing research project that engages with publishers, translators, and other stakeholder, stakeholders to work against intersectional gender bias in the translator literature sector in the UK publishing industry. She writes regular reviews and opinion pieces for the Translating Women blog, as well as freelance pieces elsewhere. And she tweets about the project at, at Translate Women. And if you're not already following the blog and the Twitter feed, I highly recommend that you do so. And in a bit, I'll put all of the links in the chat for you so you can access them. Darina Jundi is a critically acclaimed actor, director, and writer. She was born and raised in Lebanon and has been acting since the age of eight. The daughter of notorious Syrian journalist, freedom fighter, political activist, and exile, Asim al-Jundi, Darin al-Jundi is known throughout the Arab world for her television and film roles, and has also played occasional roles in popular English language series such as Homeland and Tyrants. In 2001, after the death of her father, writing became a new form of expression for Darina. Le jour où Nina Simone a cessé de chanter, the day Nina Simone stopped singing, was an instant sensation when Darina first performed it as a one-woman play at the Avignon Festival in July 2007. It sold out at every performance and resulted in multiple runs in Paris and throughout France. Darina followed this up with the sequel, the successful sequel, Ma Marseillaise, or Marseillaise My Way, which premiered at the Avignon Festival in 2012. Now, after Helen's keynote, which is entitled The Day Nina Simone Stopped Singing, Writing and Translating an Extreme Human Experience, Darina will share with us readings from both the French and the English text, and then we'll follow up with a couple of questions from me, and then we'll open up to the questions from the audience. So it is over to you. Thank you so, so much. Oh, thank you, Sandra, for that great introduction and also for inviting us to do this session. It's brilliant to, um, to see you again and to see everyone here and to be able to um, talk about translating Darina's plays um, with Darina here. And I can't wait to get into the question and answer session a bit later as well. Um, so Sandra has just told you all, um, Darina's The Day Nina Simone Stopped Singing was an instant sensation when she first performed the French original at the Avignon Festival in 2007. It's a monologue, uh, it's by turns harrowing and comical, and it recounts the coming of age of its protagonist, Noun, during the Lebanese Civil War. Noun's life is based on Darina's own. In the preface to the published manuscript, Darina describes Noun as a part of me and through Noon, Darina tells her own story on stage. So I first saw Darina perform the play in Paris in 2008. And, um, you know, in the intervening 14 years, we've had so many wonderful um, encounters and connections resulting in, um, as you know, the publication of my translation of her plays. So when I first saw Darina, it was as I walked into the theatre and I was quite taken aback to see her sitting on the floor of the stage in her red dress, smiling at the audience as we entered and took our seats. So it was eerily quiet in the theatre because it's quite awkward to make small talk when the person you've come to see perform is sitting there smiling at you. So the vulnerability is clear from the start of the performance. This is an intimate encounter. Darina, or rather Darina as Noon, doesn't wait until we're all assembled before making an entrance. Rather, she's already there waiting for us. In fact, the first line, I'd almost given up on you, 
shows that she's waiting to tell her story, this direct address forming an immediate relationship between the person telling the story and the people hearing it. The lights went down after that first line, and when they came back up, Noon choked out the start of her monologue. Mon père est mort le jour où il a cru qu'il n'avait plus d'histoire à me raconter. My father died the day he thought he had no more stories to tell me. So instantly, this is a highly personal narrative, evoking from the start Darina's own experience of growing up in Beirut with a politically dissident and devoutly secular father who wanted to raise his daughters to be free women in a time and place where women were not free. After her father's death, Darina's safety in her home city of Beirut was under threat. She was left at the mercy of the men in her family who wanted to make her pay for her refusal to conform to expectations of gender and religion, culminating in her enforced incarceration in a mental asylum. Following her release, Darina moved from Lebanon to France and gained French citizenship in 2012, a process that's fictionalized in the second play, Marseille's My Way, the sequel to The Day Nina Simone Stopped Singing. Today, I'm going to focus mostly on The Day Nina Simone Stopped Singing, though I will discuss Marseille's My Way towards the end of my talk. I'm going to talk first about how the play connects to the themes of this conference before moving on to look at some reviews of the translation to identify whether this vulnerability has carried over between languages and cultures. And then I'll discuss how the personal exposure of the original affected my approach to the translation, drawing on some examples to offer detail, and then that will lead us into some readings and then a dialogue that Sandra is going to coordinate. So often, the day Nina Simone stops singing is described as an open letter to Darina's father. And in some ways, this is accurate, but I think it's reductive to view it only in that way. It's also the story of a childhood cut short by the outbreak of civil war, a life where normal is equated with violence, both military and sexual, with death, casual sex, deep misogyny, religious segregation, and living on the edge. Standing in a hand-drawn square of black chalk, Noon cries out her past, her childhood marked by political exile and religious intransigence, her adolescence unfolding as F-16s flew over Beirut, her first sexual experiences as violent as the destruction going on around her, her losses and near misses as her beloved home city tore itself apart in civil war, her father's death, with it the loss of his protection, and the price she paid for being a woman who didn't obey the rules. The reference in the title to Nina Simone evokes both the secular music that Noon's father wanted to be played at his funeral instead of the traditional verses from the Quran, and also the griot oral storytelling tradition that Darina enters into with her monologue performances. The references to the day that Nina Simone stopped singing implies also the violent silencing of women's voices that Darina seeks to redress through her performance. So even if I would contest the view that this monologue is exclusively an open letter to Noon's father, he's ever present in the play, and to a lesser extent in the sequel. His ideals of freedom are manifest in his rejection of religion and encouragement of sexual liberation. And these are ideals that Noon takes on and tries to live out. Yet they're shown to be impossible, She's constantly being told that she's Muslim because this is the religion she would have inherited by birth and that there's no such thing as a free woman. So freedom is one of the foremost concerns of the text and its fragility maps onto the notions of women's vulnerability that underpin the focus of this conference. In a review of my translation in the Yorkshire Times, Steve Whitaker expresses the opinion that Aljundi's dangerous, self-lacerating and profoundly exposed journey of liberation demands to be heard. I've selected this particular quotation because it shows a sensitivity towards that choice to be vulnerable. The journey of liberation is profoundly exposed, a concept that's perhaps become so normalized now, but that nonetheless breaks several taboos regarding gender, culture and religion. But Whitaker also describes the monologue or Darina's journey towards freedom as self-lacerating is particularly interesting to me. I think he means it in the context of Noon's actions, which include indiscriminate sex and dicing with death. 
rather than in the context of Dalina's own self-exposure. But it made me reflect on the fine line between finding liberation through art and the danger that this self-exposure might cause further damage because of the potential responses it might elicit. And in this vein, I want to turn to another review of the translation. Veteran book blogger Jackie Law describes Noon in the following way. A rebel from childhood, Noon is unafraid to express herself in a way few women, especially Muslim women, are more usually depicted. She is profane and open about her desires. She laughs long and loud about her enjoyment of drugs and sex. Given that she was regularly abused, suffering serious physical assault at the hands of her first husband and other family members, this laughter comes across as at times inappropriate, almost hysterical. Perhaps this is to encourage the reader to judge her actions, something her father refused to do. So, firstly, I'm glad to see the acknowledgement that Muslim women, and I'd add Arab women in general, are often depicted in literature in quite stereotyped ways or edited for export to the West, but also dismissed by the Anglophone literary system. But what really interests me is finding the laughter potentially inappropriate and some kind of hysterical response to the traumas that Noon has endured. This had never occurred to me before. Noon is certainly outspoken, non-conformist and open about the painful and psychologically damaging experiences that she's endured. But I'm fascinated by this notion that perhaps we're being invited to judge. I'm not sure that I agree, but it's important that my interpretation of the text only influences the translation itself. I can't influence and shouldn't influence the response to the text because the point of self-exposure in public spaces is that we don't get to decide how people respond to our vulnerability. Also, one of the most remarkable features of Dalina's work is its humour. There's one notable section in which Noon, ra sorry, Noon rattles off a list of all the different shapes of penis that she's known. And this builds to a hilarious crescendo through the combination of amusing images and increasing rhyme. And this was probably the most challenging section of the translation. French has a much more limited range of noun endings than English does, so has a much greater capacity for rhyme, yet much of the humour comes from the rhyme. So Noon describes her conquests as follows. I hope I'm going to do this justice. I'm sure Darina will perform it better than I would. But um, <laughs> I was fascinated by dicks. I'd seen lopsided ones, dead straight ones, puffed up ones and trussed up ones, bracelets, gimlets, giblets, ringlets, wolverines, jelly beans, fudge cakes without fudge, picky ones, cheeky ones, floppy ones, stroppy ones, lightsabers, tomb raiders, space invaders and cape crusaders, hedgehogs, woodpeckers, hot dogs, double deckers, sandbaggers, jackhammers, poker faces and amazing graces. I'm not surprised that many people commenting on the translation bring this section up first and in some ways, I'd be disappointed if they didn't. Um, <laughs> in Whitaker's review, he comments that Helen Vassalo's inventory of names for dicks in translation is tireless in both assiduity and accuracy. I'll be honest, I'm not sure if tireless and assiduous were the effects I was going for. <laughs> so I'll be interested to hear what you all think later. Most people think it must have been fun to translate. I don't remember it being particularly fun at the time. But it makes me happy that it comes across this way because part of translation is, in my view, concealing the effort that goes into it. To return to the notion of exposure, we see Noon variously raped, assaulted and incarcerated. Yet she recounts <coughs> these atrocities without embellishment. And I'd like to read you a few examples. If anyone does have the texts, my first extract is pages 51 to 52. I was trapped between the bed and the wall naked, bleeding life out of me. But I was happy. I wasn't thinking about anything. I just wanted to hear the last of the bomb blasts in the Beirut night. I had just turned 17. The next is pages 63 to 64. My brother-in-law started raining punches down on me. Then he pushed me up against a barbed wire fence. I could feel the sharp ends ripping at my back. He was hitting me over and over as if he'd lost control. I fell to the ground. Before I lost consciousness, I felt him wipe his feet on my body and my face. And finally, from page 67, they had all decided I was a public menace, a danger to society, me, and the rest of them, the killers, the snipers, the thieves, the rapists, the soldiers, the fundamentalists, all of them are of sound mind and on the loose out there. 
and I'm shut up in here and mad. That's what they did to me. That was the price. Is Noon so shocking then in the way she speaks and the things she says? Maybe she is. And I'm glad to see that she can still shock 15 years after she first made her debut, because in those 15 years, the internet and in particular social media have made public sharing of private lives so normalized that we may find ourselves anesthetized by oversharing. And I'm glad that she shocks in translation because it was so crucial not to dilute either the horrors that Noon experiences or the way she laughs at her circumstances and to find words in English that did justice to both the violence and the humor of the original to maintain the shock factor in a time when public sharing of personal trauma has become commonplace. But what's particularly interesting to me in this context of self-exposure is that it's not the first time I've seen Noon judged. As I've taught this text over the years, sometimes, only occasionally, but sometimes, I've come up against responses that Darina brought her punishment on herself by behaving in a way she knew would not be accepted. So let me be clear, they imply here that she deserved to be beaten to a pulp, publicly humiliated, and then locked away in a mental asylum because she showed her breasts in public. So the vulnerability of that horrific experience is then compounded by the vulnerability of its recounting. And this is where I think public vulnerability can potentially cause damage. I'd say it's more to do with those responses that we cannot control. And we only have to think about internet trolls to see the contemporary reality of that. So this is a painful story that publicly exposes Dalina's traumatic experiences, and yet she insists that it's not a therapy through performance. Rather, Noon becomes a mouthpiece through whom Dalina both shares her vulnerability and fights back against it, writer and protagonist standing together against the individuals and groups who've attempted to silence this story. Perhaps the most raw of all the scenes is one in which Noon is playing a cocaine fueled game of Russian roulette with her boyfriend Ramzi and their friend Hussein. Hussein wants to leave Lebanon and Ramzi is trying to calm him down. I passed the gun to Ramzi. He forgot to spin the cylinder. He teased Hussein. Come on, you can't leave. Lebanon is amazing. And he pulled the trigger. I saw his brain burst out of his skull. This final sentence before the lights go down on that scene is stark in its violence and tragedy. I'm not entirely satisfied with it as a translation. The French original, J'ai vu son cerveau giclé de la boîte canyenne, has a more satisfying rhythm to it, but the equivalent of boîte canyenne in English is cranium, which is too medical and sterile a term and still doesn't get the rhythm. But what I want to focus on here are the stage directions because they tell us that this is when Noon truly breaks. Noon falls to the floor and caves in on herself. It's the only time she cries. The only moment when you really feel that this war has destroyed her, that they were all destroying each other. Even when death wasn't seeking them out, they went courting it. This is the moment of absolute tragedy for her. She sees Ramzi, she sees him dead. She sees his brains splattered across the room and she sees how inhuman they had become and how that war had turned them all into monsters. Whether in the humor or the tragedy, the challenge for me was to recreate the rapport between actor and audience or for the published version between narrator and reader. But what I didn't realize when I began the translation, despite my familiarity with the text, was just how important those stage directions are here. In my first draft, I bashed them out quite mechanically, concentrating more on the monologue itself, and if I'm honest, I saw them as a bit of an intrusion on the creative process. It was only in my later revisions that I came to realize how important these stage directions were. They tell us how Noon is occupying the stage, how she's connecting with the audience, and how she's feeling when she cannot articulate that herself. And this seems to me an excellent example of the politics of vulnerability in literature, using genre conventions to avoid the over-confessional first-person outpouring. So Noon's voice is also constantly imbricated with her sociocultural context. And so her vulnerability is one way of showing the horrors she's endured during her experiences of war and incarceration, detailed in the day Nina Simone stopped singing, and bureaucracy, instability, and rejection in Marseille as my way. 
In this second play, Noon has left Beirut and is attempting to secure French citizenship, a long and tortuous ordeal that's frustrated by red tape, missing papers and hostile administrative staff. In particular, it shows the vulnerability of women from Arab cultures attempting to gain citizenship in the West. Having fled her home country for the way she's imprisoned in stereotypes of gender and religion, Noon finds that the same happens all over again in the West. In my view, there are three main things at stake in Marseille as my way. One is a more general and particularly timely reflection on the futility of war. Though Noon is no longer living in a war zone, her work takes her to places that show her how conflicts, both domestic and international, ravage our societies. As Dalina writes in her postscript, I was furious with our countries that turn these young people, these nations into refugees, these people who have the misfortune to be born on the wrong side of the world, where dictators think nothing of slaughtering an entire nation just to stay in power. I'm sure you can feel the chilling contemporary resonance of that comment, originally written 10 years ago. The second important thing, I think, is the restriction of women, even in so-called democratic or progressive societies. As well as offering details of women's suffering in Arab countries, so the mother whose daughter dies from genital mutilation, the wife buried up to her neck on her family farm and stoned, Noon talks about how Arab women in Europe are judged, sometimes literally judged in court, according to the laws of their homeland. And then the third interesting point is the hostility towards immigrants, despite apparent policies of welcoming, which I think is, again, very timely, despite the fact that it was originally written a decade ago. Noon broaches all of these with her characteristic frank frankness, a defiant indictment tinged with her trademark dark humour. And in a particularly memorable scene, she describes one of her many trips to the town hall as follows. If anyone has the text, it's pages 33 to 34. To put together the elusive application, every visit to the town hall is a half day wasted. And you should see how the applicants get treated, the things they put you through so you can find out which application form you need to fill out and how to fill it in. The whole thing is a charade performed right before your eyes. You get there, you take your number and you wait. And of course, there's no privacy. You don't get asked all these questions in a separate office. It all happens in front of everyone else. I must just say, I'm so delighted to see that the editor of this book, Sue Vickerman, is actually here. We've never met in person, but Sue helped me with a couple of details in this particular paragraph I'm very grateful for. And um, so maybe she'll be able to um, join in some of the, the dialogue a bit later on. Um, but in terms of exposure, I think it's double here. Not only is Darina exposing her story to her audience, but also Noon is exposed in front of all the other applicants and forced to recount at the top of her voice the details of her four marriages, unable to explain to the club or by extension to the other people waiting their turn that she had to make these choices in order to be safe in her home country. And what Noon wants most of all is to feel safe, which shows us just how much her vulnerability has affected her. She thinks that she'll be safe in France, which she describes as a country where I'll feel equal to everyone else, regardless of colour, background or gender. A country where I can express myself freely without paying a price for it. And so she subjects herself to this exposure and scrutiny in order to feel safe. Perhaps we could say something similar of Dalina writing her story. There is, after all, safety in being able to control your own story. However, as I indicated earlier, once this goes into the public domain, there's no way to control how it's received. And on the subject of reception, I had three main broad considerations in preparing my translation of both plays. First, to accurately represent Noon's voice. And this might sound like a vague or obvious goal, but I was aware that when Darina wrote this, she was using Noon to describe her own experiences and to cry out her own thoughts. I was coming at it as a white Western woman who's never lived through a war, never been beaten up for being unsubmissive, never been incarcerated by her family or forced into exile. And I'm not suggesting that we need to have experienced things to write or translate them believably. After all, the greatest quality of any writer is surely empathy and the ability to inhabit another's story. But I certainly didn't have the proximity to the story that Davina does. The second objective was that my own ideological positions or experiences should not influence the way I translated. None should speak uncensored by me. 
And finally, I wanted to ensure that in getting Noon's voice, the translation might elicit an audience or reader reception comparable to the one it's enjoyed throughout its success in French. The comedy and drama of Diana's performance rest on that intimacy between her and the audience. So to see whether or not this was successful, I'm going to turn again to a couple of reviews. David Hebblethwaite, a blogger who writes prolifically about translated literature, sums up his response to Noon in the following way. Noon comes across as a vivid, complex character in this thought-provoking piece of work. I was pleased to see this response as Noon in French is exactly this, vivid and complex. We can't reduce her um, and there are many facets to her and in some ways it's very difficult to sum her up. So I think those were very well chosen words. So to receive this response to the translation is a great relief in terms of the success of the translation itself. Knowing this place so well and knowing its critical response in French so well, it's extremely pleasing to, re to read responses to Noon in translation that are exactly as I understand her. Whitaker, meanwhile, notes that the narrator's tone is insouciantly defiant. Defiant? Absolutely. But insouciant made me pause for thought. I think Noon is far more aware of the weight of what she's saying, but Perhaps this is because I read the first play in the context of the second, in which we find out more about her fears. So I don't necessarily equate her ability to find the humour or the joy, even in life's darkest moments, with insouciance. Or perhaps I've just not succeeded in communicating this. However, Whitaker does continue by asserting that the story unfolds into a hall of mirrors where certainties are compromised by recrimination and carefully nourished truths are later renegotiated. If there's anything that can explicitly connect this monologue to contemporary culture, surely it's this, a space where carefully nourished truths can be later renegotiated or reconsidered. The reference to a hall of mirrors is also particularly interesting in the context of public vulnerability because we live in a time where our experiences made public are then distorted in ways that we cannot control. So I'd like to conclude by turning again to Whitaker's review, which comments on the text as performance. Whitaker notes that, we are reminded that Aljundi's mandate as witness is to collapse the flimsy walls of the theater to expose the limits of degradation in a world beyond comfortable margins. In recounting her story, Darina is not only exposing herself, but also a world beyond comfortable margins. And this is precisely where the power of her writing lies. It's not self-indulgent or self-pitying, but rather invites us as readers and audience to bear witness, to find our shared humanity, whether or not we share Moon's views, whether or not we relate to her experience. It's not comfortable, but I'm not convinced that art should be comfortable. And in responding to Darina's self-exposure, I find it impossible not to question myself and my assumptions. So if her work engages with the politics of vulnerability, I believe it's by inviting her audience and readers to drop our own defenses and occupy that same space of vulnerability and self-revelation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Helen. That was absolutely brilliant. And I'm, I'm lost for words. <laughs> I'm not going to say anything and hand over to Darina for the readings. Okay. I, I just wanted to say a couple of things that it's true. Noon is, is like my um, uh, alter ego. Um, but it's not completely me. It's not 100% me. I always say it's an auto fiction. It's not a, a, a biographic work about me. And it's my way of working as an actress. I always use my life and I've based all my work on improvisation as an actress. And it means you use your life to express what you want to express. Um, and, and this is how I work. So this is why I always say it's not a therapy. If it was a therapy, that means it's for, for once you do it. It's not a way of working. So this is my way of, of working and doing things in theatre. For the title of Le Jour Nina Simone a cessé de chanter, um, there's a part in the play where the violence started. And in real life, uh, they were playing this song, that it's my favourite song. 
the uh, senior man. And then when the violence started, the music stopped. And in my head, it really stopped. And it stopped for five years. I couldn't listen for music for five years because music means freedom. When I hear music, I want to dance. And dancing is freedom. And being free in my country wasn't possible anymore for me. So this is where comes the title. It's not really a title that wanted to be catchy. It was really just what I felt. And I just wanted to say another thing. Thank you, Helen. <laughs> You've like made my life since the minute we met. And our journey will continue, I hope, because there are going to be more. <laughs> I will start with the French. Mon père est mort le jour où il a cru qu'il n'avait plus d'histoire à me raconter. Je suis devant sa dépouille, il est nu, au milieu de la grande pièce, recouvert d'un simple linceul blanc. Allongé sur le dos, il a les mains croisées sur le sexe. Je le regarde. Il a l'air tellement serein. C'est la première fois de ma vie où je le sens en paix. Je ne regrette pas sa mort. Je savais depuis longtemps qu'il allait mourir, parce qu'il m'avait tout dit. De la fenêtre ouverte, je vois les maisons de mon village, Ermoun, qu'on appelle Château de Beaufort. Les maisons bombardées fument encore. L'armée israélienne vient juste d'évacuer le sud du Liban après 20 ans d'occupation. Je vois les collines alentour. Elles sont noires de monde. Les gens sont venus de Tyr, de Sidon, de Damas, d'Alep, de Beyrouth, de Amman, assister aux funérailles de mon père. Je lui caresse le visage. Il a une peau de bébé, même pas froide. C'est le mois de janvier. Il pleut. Je sens l'odeur de la pluie monter de la terre rouge du sud Liban. La porte de la chambre s'ouvre. Des femmes en noir surgissent. Elles pleurent, elles gémissent. Elles se jettent sur mon père. Elles lui embrassent le visage, elles lui embrassent les mains, elles lui embrassent les pieds avec une avidité. Je lui murmure à l'oreille, « Salopard, tu n'en rates pas une <rire> !» Soudain, j'entends une voix étrange qui me déchire le ventre. C'est un cri insupportable qui me fend le crâne. Un cri me troue la peau, il me tronçonne la tête. Quelqu'un est en train de hurler des sourates du Coran. <coughs> J'ouvre la porte de la pièce voisine. Elle est pleine de femmes en noir. Elles pleurent autour d'un post-cassette qui diffuse les prières. J'enjambe les femmes, je les piétine, je m'empare du post-cassette, je coupe le son. Les femmes poussent un cri d'horreur. Ma mère, mes sœurs tentent de me rattraper. « Arrête, tu es folle, reviens, ce n'est pas le moment !» Je cours me réfugier dans la chambre de mon père. Je ferme à double tour la lourde porte en chaîne. J'entends mon beau-frère cogner la porte. « Espèce de folle, remets le Coran, sinon je te tue. Ouvre, salope, ouvre, on ne coupe pas la parole de Dieu. Ouvre, putain, on ne touche pas au livre de Dieu. Tu n'as pas intérêt à me toucher. On ne l'a pas encore enterré que ce Dieu n'est pas le Dieu de mon père. » Il n'a jamais eu de Dieu, mon père. Il m'a fait jurer. Ma fille, fais gaffe à ce que ces chiens ne mettent pas du Coran le jour de ma mort. Ma fille, je t'en prie, je voudrais du jazz à ma mort et même du hip-hop, mais surtout pas du Coran. My father died the day he thought he had no more stories to tell me. I'm with his body now. He's naked in the middle of the room, covered with a simple white shroud. He's lying on his back, hands folded across his crotch. Looking at him, he seems so peaceful. It's the first time in my life I've seen him at peace. I'm not sad that he's gone. I'd known for a long time that he was going to die because he'd already told me everything. Through the open window, I can see the houses of my village, Ermund, the fortress of Bufour. There's still smoking rise, smoke rising from the bombed outhouses. The Israeli army has just withdrawn from southern Lebanon after 20 years of occupation. I can see the surrounding hills teeming with people. They've come from Tyr, from Sidon, from Damascus, Aleppo, Beirut, and Amman to attend my father's funeral. 
I stroke his face. It's so soft, not even cold. It's January. It's raining. I can smell the scent of the rain rising up from the red earth of southern Lebanon. The door opens. Women dressed in black come pouring in. They're weeping and wailing. They hurl themselves on my father. They kiss his face. They kiss his hands. They kiss his feet as if they wanted to gobble him up. I whisper in his ear, you sly dog, you don't miss a trick, do you? Suddenly I hear a strange voice that chills me to the bone, an unbearable moan that cuts right through me, a wail that lashes at my skin and hacks at my skull. Someone is holding out verses of the Quran. I open the door to the next room. It's full of weeping women dressed in black, all huddled around the cassette player that's spitting out the prayers. I push past them all, trembling on them. I grab hold of the cassette player and turn it off. The women cry out in horror. My mother and my sisters try to hold me back. Stop! Stop it! What's wrong with you? Come back! Now is not the time. I run away from them into my father's room and deadlock the heavy oak door. I can hear my brother-in-law pounding on it, shouting, you crazy bitch, put the Quran back or I'll kill you. Open up, bitch, open the door. No one cuts short the word of God. Open up, you little whore. No one touches the holy book. Don't you lay a finger on me. He hasn't even been buried yet. And it's not my father's God. My father never even had a God. He made me promise him, Noon, make sure those bastards don't stick on the Quran at my funeral. Noon, promise me, put on jazz at my funeral, maybe even hip hop, but definitely not Quran. We're going to Mama Seyez. I just wanted to say something about Mama Seyez, Mama my way is that uh, I never thought that really, I, I, I said it in the, in the play, I never thought that art is capable still of changing lives or changing anything in the world. Well, it's still, at least for me and for others that came after me, because this play changed a lot, a lot in France and to, to, to give me the right to have the French nationality. And it's uh, after the uh, premiere in, in Avignon, um, Le Monde wrote a, an article and they said that Marianne, which is the some symbol of the French public, doesn't know her sisters anymore. And that day, the Minister of Interior called me at the theater and announced to me that he's going to change the law so I can be able to have the, the French citizen. And this is how I got it. Because for me, this was a way of being safe. And this is how sometimes my life and the art that I do just come combining together to make my life even better. <laughs> so, Mama Seyez. Ah, I had another part of uh, Le Jour de Nina Simone that I have to read. No, yes, sorry. <laughs> pardon, pardon, error. If there's time, Davina, I know that you need to get off to your next can engagement. So if you want to just okay. go straight to Ma Marseillaise, you can. Ma Marseillaise? It's as you want. Okay, we go to Marseillaise directly. C'est bien que je sois parti. Il était temps. Depuis mon arrivée, je n'arrête pas de travailler. Avec le travail, je voyage beaucoup. À chaque voyage, c'est la galère pour les visas. Je ne veux plus attendre dans les ambassades, subir les regards, l'humiliation des employés et ne parlons même pas des aéroports. À chaque voyage, je prépare une série de blagues pour amuser l'officier qui doit tamponner mon passeport. Alors que Karine, on voyage souvent ensemble pour le boulot, elle, Elle n'a jamais son passeport. « Je n'en ai pas besoin », elle me dit. « Yi 
Comment ne pas avoir ce sa carte d'identité, la carte grise, l'acte de naissance et tous les papiers possibles et imaginables quand on se déplace, y compris dans la même ville Et s'il y a un checkpoint, qu'est-ce que je fais, moi Stop, ça doit s'arrêter. Qu'on me traite comme les autres, au moins comme Karine, même si c'est une blonde. Je devrais peut-être me teindre en blonde. Ça fait plus occidental, non Je dois trouver une solution pour me sentir un être humain. Ah, la carte des dix ans pour en finir avec les cartes de séjour et préparer enfin le dossier de naturalisation. À nouveau, les attentes, les queues, les numéros, les journées ratées, les documents à fournir, les uns plus abracadabrants que les autres et le risque de ne pas obtenir les papiers. Deux fois, ils me l'ont refusé. La raison Vous n'avez pas, madame, pendant les deux premières années, gagné assez d'argent. J'ai cru que j'allais mourir. Re... J'ai cru qu'on me refusait tous ces jours tout court. Je me suis vue là-bas, juste avant de partir, avec la peur au ventre, la peur des autres, la peur de les provoquer, être obligée sans arrêt de me défendre contre l'intimidation et la violence. J'ai vu ces rues où je ne pouvais plus marcher. J'ai pleuré, j'ai pleuré, j'ai pleuré devant le monsieur. <rire> le pauvre, il ne savait plus où se mettre. Calmez-vous, madame, vous avez bien obtenu la carte des neuf mois, mais malheureusement, pas celle des dix ans. J'ai arrêté de pleurer. La deuxième tentative n'a pas été plus brillante. Le jour du rendez-vous, beaucoup d'employés étaient absents. Ceux qui étaient présents essayaient de convaincre les gens de revenir un autre jour. Tout le monde a eu peur. Ils ont préféré attendre. Je ne sais pas pourquoi, quand mon tour est arrivé et que le monsieur m'a dit « Madame, si vous acceptez de revenir un autre jour, je vous donne le passe prioritaire. » Je l'ai regardé droit dans les yeux. J'ai rassemblé tout mon courage. « Oui !»« Oui, oui, monsieur, j'accepte !» Il a voulu me remercier. Et là, j'ai poussé un peu. « Ah, mais non !» J'ai accepté de changer mon rendez-vous, car vous, vous en avez vraiment besoin. Donc, vous devriez vous lever et me remercier au nom de la République. <rire> Il s'est levé. « Madame, au nom de la République, je vous remercie d'avoir accepté. <rire> »« Tout ce cirque n'a servi à rien. » Ils me l'ont re-refusé. Il ne me restait qu'une seule chose à faire, naturalisation. J'ai les cinq ans nécessaires, j'ai le droit de présenter le dossier. Le chemin de croix a commencé. It's a good thing I left. It was time. Since I got here, I haven't stopped working. With my work, I travel a lot. Every time I have to travel, it's a nightmare to get a visa. I don't want to have to wait in embassies anymore or put up with people staring or the way the employees are treated. And let's not get started on what happens at airports. For every tip I take, I prepare a set of jokes to keep the officer who has to stamp my passport amused. Where's Karin? We travel together a lot for work. Never even have, has her passport. I don't need it, she says. Yee! How can you not have your passport, your ID card, your car registration document, your birth certificate, and all papers you can possibly imagine whenever you go anywhere, even in your own city? And if there's a checkpoint, what do I do, huh? Stop. I have to stop thinking like this. I just want to be treated like everyone else, or at least like Karine, even if she is blonde. <laughs> ah, maybe I should just dye my hair blonde. That's more Western, right? I need to find a solution that makes me feel like I'm a human being. Ah, the 10 years visa. So I don't have to deal with these temporary visas anymore, and I can finally put together an application for naturalization. Once again, the waiting, the queues the numbers, the wasted days, the documents to provide, each more ludicrous than they last, and the constant risk of not getting my papers. They've already turned me down twice. Want to know why? Madame, in your first two years here, you didn't earn enough money. I thought I was going to die. I thought they were turning me down point blank for any kind of permit. I saw myself back there. Just before I left, sick to the stomach, terrified of everyone, terrified of upsetting them, having to defend myself constantly against intimidation and violence. 
I saw those, I saw those streets where I couldn't walk freely anymore. And I weep, I weep, I weep on the clerk. Poor man, he didn't know what to do with himself. Calm down, madame. You can still have the nine-month visa, just not the 10-year one. I stopped crying. The second attempt was not exactly covered in glory either. On the day of my appointment, there were a lot of clerks of work. The ones who were there trying to pursue people to come back another day. Everyone was afraid. We all wanted to stay and wait. I don't know why. But when it came to, to my turn, the man said, Madam, if you agree to come back another day, I'll give you a priority pass. I looked him straight in the eyes and gathered up all my courage. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, I'll come back another day. He was so relieved and grateful. So I pushed him a bit. Ah, wait a minute. I agreed to change my appointment because you really needed someone to help you out. So you should stand up and thank me on behalf of the French Republic. <laughs> he stood up, Madame, on behalf of the French Republic, I thank you for having agreed. <laughs> the whole palaver was, was pointless. They turned down my application again. There was only one thing left to do, naturalization. I have the five-year residence. You need to be eligible so I can put in an application. And so the ordeal began. <coughs> Thank you so much. What an absolute treat. Again, I, I'm I'm lost for words, and I'm supposed to be <laughs> to be asking questions, <laughs> and I have a no, I've got a sort of a, uh, a in my throat, you know, sort of holding back um, emotions. But thank you so much for that treat. What I will do just to sort of get us started and so that I can get back into into question mode is that I will put in the chat for everybody the article that you mentioned in Le Monde that actually details the the law that was changed and how the play actually helped other people that came after after you in, in getting naturalization. Thank you so much Helen, thank you so much Darina and if it's all right with everybody it will spend about 10, 15 minutes with a couple of sort of questions that I prepared in advance because I had a fantastic weekend just going through the texts and the books and the reviews. So I've put all of the links to the reviews that Helen mentioned, they're all in the chat. So if everybody wants, if anybody wants to follow up, just, just click on them. And then we'll open it up from questions from, from the audience. And I promise that I won't eat into the audience's time. Um, the way I've sort of thought about this, I've kind of selected a couple of themes. So I've got on each of those themes, a question for Helen and a question for Darina. I'll ask both of those questions and then you see kind of who wants to go first. If you want to share it as a dialogue, it really very much is up to you. So in the day Nina Simone stopped singing, and Helen, you've mentioned this in your paper as well, the stage directions are both a part of the text and apart from it. They're a part of because they often read like an inner monologue sometimes or an explanation, almost an interpretation. I was telling Helen this, that I could sort of see echoes to the novel in those, in those stage directions. So I could almost hear sometimes the, the novel through them as well. But they're graphically marked, so they're apart from the text. They appear in italics, in both French and in English. And in French, they're in brackets in the text. And then in English, they come up as a, as a separate paragraph in italics. So for Helen, just sort of if you wanted to sort of tell us a bit more about the challenges of translating those stage directions. And for Darina, the kind of two sub questions. Yes. <laughs> I want to tell you about these things that you're talking about. Actually, it's for me, it was I wanted to tell them what was going on in the head of Noon, not me, not Darina, mm -hmm. Noon, the character that I'm playing, that in her head, in the moments that she stops or the moments that she moves or the moments that she's not saying anything, actually she has her inner voice that she's talking in her head. So I wanted, which I could, I can never give it to the public in the, on stage, but I can offer it in the book as if I'm telling them her, what she's thinking of, what, what makes her go from one point to another and what makes her say what she is going to say. So it's really her own inner dialogue with herself. You've, you've anticipated well, my, my first sub question there, Diana, so that's absolutely perfect. But as a sort of, as a personal curiosity as well, when 
playing when acting out in English, so when doing the play in English, are you referring to the English in text uh, stage directions or to the still to the sort of the French ones, which obviously you know very well. So you know the text is almost part of you, part of part of your your body, and you know part of. Uh, it's the same. I mean, actually, it's the same. Helen did the had great job, <laughs> uh, and it's the, the same thing. It's what Moon is having inside of her that was an, uh, an acting. You can see it in reading. You cannot. So I'm offering. I offered this. Yeah, I was going to say something similar. Actually, that of course, when Darina is performing, then you don't need the stage directions because you see it through her performance, and you know. Through her acting, you 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 understand what Moon is feeling, the desperation, and so on. Um, and uh, I have to also say, when you say the stage directions are apart from the text, and I have to shout out to Mike. I didn't realize Mike was here. Mike, the publisher. Um, I think his formatting. Um, sorry, Mike, the publisher, as if that's your full name. Mike Kill Killian, the publisher, and Naked Eye. Um, and the formatting, I think, in the English version is much clearer. The stage directions are taken apart from the original. And when I submitted the manuscript to him, the stage directions were as they are in the French, which is just that they're within the text. And I think that was one of the issues I had with them, that I found them quite intrusive because they were just, you know, compressed in with the actual monologue itself. So I personally think that aesthetically it works a lot better with that separation. And in terms of the way you respond to the text and see it almost as two different things. One is what Darina is saying, sorry, what Noon is saying, and another is what Noon is thinking. Um, but you asked about translating them. And, you know, as I said, I, at the beginning, I was kind of quite mechanical about them. I can't even remember if I translated all of the stage directions first or if I came back to them later. I definitely came back to the section about dicks a lot later on um, and kind of left that for a long time with just a big blank paragraph saying, insert list of dicks here um, for quite some time. And uh, if anyone's just joining, then they will find that really bizarre. So they'll have to watch the YouTube recording and rewind. Um, but so all I remember feeling is that they were a bit intrusive on the creative process. And I think that's because I found them intrusive in the French publication, because I'd seen Darina perform both of these, obviously, without the stage directions. And maybe that was arrogant of me, that I didn't see how helpful they actually were in terms of understanding more about what I needed to translate. And so once I kind of had that click, you know, that moment where I realized that, okay, these stage directions are just as much a part of the text. They are what Noon is thinking. And they're telling me there were so many times, especially with Marseille as my way, where Noon moves around the stage much more. And it was really helpful to try and visualize where she was and how her body was, you know, being held at a particular point. So they were really helpful in that sense. Um, and, you know, I think I, I massively underestimated their importance at the beginning. And I wondered whether readers might find them intrusive in the way that I originally had and whether that might be kind of an impediment to people wanting to read the text. And I had a conversation with Mike about this actually. And he felt that they were a really integral part of the text and he was right. Um, so I'm really glad that they're there and that, you know, they they helped me, I think, make the monologue itself as good as it could be. Thank you so much. And you've mentioned Marseille as my way, and that's that leads in really nicely to my next question, which is about the title of, and the title in both French and English, so the title of Marseille as my way and how you, I absolutely love the title, and I've told you this in, in, in email exchanges as well. Um, so, for Helen, you know, kind of, if you could tell us a bit more about the process of getting to Marseille as my way, which is obviously not the, you know, literal translation of uh, Ma Marseillaise. Yeah. And for Darina, in the preface to Ma Marseillaise, there's a sort of an avant-propos by Philippe Cobert, and he mentions that, you know, the initial title was uh, Pute Fier, so whore and proud of it. So how did we get from, you know, Pute Fier to Ma Marseillaise? What was the process <laughs> for you on get, from getting to that title? Well, because in the, in the beginning, the, the, I've changed the, the way that the play was going to, uh, to where the play was going. And in the middle of the uh, uh, working on, on the writing, Put uh, Fier didn't um, uh, cover the whole meaning of the play. So suddenly Ma Marseillaise came more 
um, logically as a title. But for me, the title that Helen found, like Marseille is my way, I, it was a, I was really surprised, positively surprised, happy surprised, uh, because I think it's a very good title. And because it's not translating literally La, La, La Ma Marseillaise, uh, and I loved it. <laughs> Um, yeah, I was actually so relieved. There was one memorable morning um, I was just out walking and my phone buzzed. In fact, my wristwatch buzzed because they're connected and there was this message from Darina saying, I love the title. And I, I was very relieved um, because, you know, obviously when you're working with somebody else's original work, then you want them to to be pleased with how you're rendering it. But the title did pose a problem for a long time. It was just My Marseillaise. But well, it was just really, you know, what does that even mean to an English person? Because, of course, in French, the national anthem is La Marseillaise. So Ma Marseillaise already implies it's the national anthem my way. Um, I'm doing it my way. And that's very much, you know, how Noon is going ahead and doing things on her own. And I was thinking actually just about music and the importance of music in Davina's work. And so she was talking earlier about the importance of Nina Simone generally um, in her personal life, as well as um, in, in terms of how it comes across in the play's title and in what that means. But then, of course, um, Massey as My Way has as this constant refrain, Noon trying to learn the national anthem by heart and questioning the lyrics, you know, because it's all, it's very violent and um, it's, it's a very um, aggressive national anthem with <laughs> references to these figures from history and do people singing it even know who they are? You know, she goes away, looks it up, finds out and so on. Um, and so music is just so important and um, throughout this, but music is a form of liberation. So whether it's Nina Simone kind of, um, the, the freedom songs, that was something that was going through my head, the freedom songs of Nina Simone. And I ended up kind of going via Bob Marley and Redemption Song. And I was just trying to think of, um, you know, songs that kind of really encapsulated this idea of doing something against the way that everyone else is telling you it should be done. And it just, you know, you can't exactly kind of pinpoint the process because at some point you just have a creative light bulb moment. And I just thought, yeah, she's doing it her way. I do it my way. And then the my, you actually get the my, ma, Marseillaise. Um, but you have the implication that, you know, this is known going against everything that people expect and everything that people assume identity to be. So I wish I could say that there was a really kind of linear and progress towards this point, but it was far more kind of um, uh, free form than that, I think. But I'm just really delighted that um, Dalina was happy with it. And, and obviously that you are as well, Sandra, as one of the people who knows this text so intimately. And uh, I think I'm going to ask my last, I've got loads of other questions, but I'm going to ask just one more because I don't want to take away from, from the audience. In both plays, there's a sense of urgency. And I was I was rereading re them now, and I've seen the performance of Nina, the, the, Nina, the day Nina Simone stopped singing in Paris years ago. Um, I, I get the feeling that that sense of urgency is is differently. It's a different sense of urgency in both, but I haven't quite sort of pinned it down. At, not even in my head how that is different. But Noon is, you know, she she needs to tell her story in the day Nina Simone stopped singing, and in Ma Marseillaise, there's this sense she repeats often I don't have time anymore you know I have to I have to, to tell I don't have enough time and I was just wondering how does this sense of urgency affect the translation process and um, how does it affect the performance for for Darina for those of for those of us who haven't seen all of the performances of my Marseillaise as well on the first one um, well actually I'm a person that will not try it or do something if it's not urgent if it's not like <laughs> I'll die if I don't do it. Uh, I don't do things out of luxury or out of um, just want to do the play or be an actor, so write a book. No, it's something like if I don't take it out, I would actually die for sure. So um, that's, that's the urgent thing that comes in all the work that I do. That's the sense of you feel like it's really urgent because it is for me. Otherwise, I would have not done it. Um, that's why I did write these two plays, both of them, because there was something urgent for me to say. 
Yeah, and for me, I think, as I was saying earlier, it's it's kind of by proxy, isn't it? In the same way that I'm translating experiences that I haven't lived through. And, you know, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. It's a really interesting debate, wasn't there, around the Amanda Gorman poem at Joe Biden's inauguration and about the translation and how, you know, translations should be done by people who have shared characteristics. Um, you know, I suppose if we wanted to be fairly essential about it, there is an obvious connection between Darina and me. But I would like to think that, um, that actually any writer or translator should be able to, I'm not saying they can, I'm saying they should be able to um, write about someone else's experience. And I suppose the same thing would be um, the response to your question about urgency, Sandra, that the urgency wasn't there for me personally because it's not my story. If anything, the urgency was just kind of more how committed I was to these stories and how much I wanted them to exist in English. Um, but it was really just about um, communicating that rather than necessarily feeling it myself. Does that make sense? Mm. <laughs> Absolutely. And I will sort of, you know, put a stop to my questions. I might carry on via email, uh, but I'm going to opening up, opening up to the floor. I know we've got that enough for another sort of 25, 30 minutes, uh, but anybody, virtual hands up or real hands up or the chat. Well, in that case, I'll, 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 use, I'll use another one. This, this is great for me. <laughs> uh, and maybe that will sort of, oh no, we've got Tina with a question. Go for it, Tina. Here I am. Sorry, I was sorry. I, I was just trying to formulate my 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 thought, my question in my head because um, it's just uh, the the presentation by Helen was so so fantastic, and that that reading I uh, I feel like by Darina I feel like we should have you know I, I feel like we've really been just given the, such an enormous privilege. So thank you so much for that. Thank it's you. absolutely exquisite. Um, and um, this is actually a question that might have, th this is some, a point that might've been mentioned and maybe I missed it, but um, how, I mean, how, so obviously this is an incredibly personal, um, you know, piece of writing. Um, and, and I understand that it's not, it's not, you know, fully based on, on, on your own life, Darina, but obviously a, a huge part of you is in there. And so I would imagine oh. you feel you know, uh, you, you feel very protective of of the material. Um, when, Not really. <laughs> oh right. Well, well. My, my, my question is though, when when um, what was the process? Of, did did Helen approach you first about doing the translation? Um, you know, and if so, how? A, 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 or or was it the publisher that approached you? And how did you know? How did you feel about the idea of being translated into English? And when did you meet Helen and how did you feel about, um, you know, the, the, do the two of you have a lot of, um, have a lot of contact during the translation process or was it mostly afterward or just curious about the, you know, the interplay because I think the relationship in a case like this between authors and important, translators yeah. is so important, yeah. yeah. Well, actually, it started with the play, The Day Nina Simone Stopped Singing, when I was uh, performing in Paris. I think Helen told me that she uh, um, took the book uh, from the <laughs> library and she was uh, pissed off from the man who didn't want her to buy something. Actually, she took it and she read it, and then she saw that I was in performing. She came and saw the play, and I think that she loved it. <laughs> and she, she made contact with me. We met. And practically, directly, we, we felt like uh, alchemy is, is working between us. A kind of friendship started to grow between Helen and me. And then she invited me to Exeter to talk about the, the play and the book. Uh, we continued on seeing each other every time she passes in Paris. So she came to Avignon when I was performing. We kept on talking by emails, by seeing each other. And since the beginning, she and presented her, her her desire to to bring this uh, these uh, plays to the english public which was like a, a beautiful gift for me uh, but actually it's the love of helen and her desire 
and her enthusiasm um, for the place that made this project possible. Uh, she looked for the publisher, she looked for everything. She worked on it without even knowing as if she is going to succeed one day to, top, to publish them. Uh, and actually, I'm not a very protective person for the work I do. I, 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 I know how to um, have confidence in other. When I say yes for a thing, it means that I'm 100% confident that this person will do justice to the work. And I've never uh, doubted uh, Helen's uh, capacities for being, uh, for bringing it uh, as I, I, I would wish. Um, during her work, there was sometimes she would come back to me to, to ask me about things, about how would I prefer this, the music of this word with this or not. But it's not like she, we were like on a constant daily uh, 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 contact for everything she was doing. She had the whole freedom of, of working and, and letting her uh, way of feelings and, and looking at this work uh, to be on this translation, not just me working on and uh, trying to get her uh, to to get to be in the work, like on each word, not at all. She had really um, hundred percent confidence, freedom to do whatever she wanted to do with it, and for me, she did a beautiful job. But she was behind all of this. She was behind her efforts, her time. She put years to be able to do it and to find someone who believe in what she wants to present and it's like the uh, most beautiful gift anyone can ever offer me. Oh, thank you. Can I add a little bit about the process as well, Tina? Is that okay? Please. Um, so, I mean, I have to just say quickly because it's, I mean, it's 14 years ago and Davina will have met many people around this time, but I hadn't read the book before seeing the play. I'd just kind of randomly been looking through the um, theatre, the Freebie Theatre magazine in Paris when I was there in 2008. Mm -hmm. And I'd been really struck by the picture and the text about this play. And I booked tickets to go with a friend. And I just kind of sat there for the hour and 20 minutes, just kind of transfixed. And it was, you know, one of those moments that you'll never forget. And um, came down and there was this stack of books, to, you know, where you could buy the book. And um, oh, yes, that was when it only yes, existed yeah. as a novel. It didn't exist as a manuscript, a published manuscript. And um, so I bought it, obviously. And then the person I bought it from said, oh, if you wait a moment, Davina's going to come out. And I just thought, ah, what do I say to her? You know, because you know when there are things that actually make you speechless? And it was just, you know, I remember really inarticulately kind of going, merci, c'était excellent, or something really banal like that. Like not able to say how moved I'd been because I just didn't even have the words. Um, and so, yeah, it's been kind of years and years of being in touch and of our friendship growing and our contact growing. But during the translation process, we had we did have a couple of meetings, didn't we, um, via Skype? You know, it was in the days before yeah. Zoom. Um, so other brands are, I'm sure, available. But um, but we had these meetings, and they were actually they were really intense. And sometimes we locked horns a little bit on particular instances. So because it's a performance text. Darlene is very clear about how she will perform a given line. So, no, I need that word to be at the end because that's where the emphasis goes. Mm -hmm. And I strike the floor when I say this word. And, and I'd just be there kind of saying, but syntactically in English, that word can't go at the end. So, you know, we had quite a lot of back and forth about those sorts of things. And I just remember, I don't know if you remember this, Darlene, but there was one time when I said, it's impossible, you can't do this in English. And she said to me, you trouve le moyen, find a way. <laughs> and, but, you know, being pushed like that is great, but someone's not just accepting that you say, oh, no, I can't do that, and saying, no, 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 but you find how to do it. And, um, you know, thankfully, I did find a way to do that. But there were other things like um, the intensity of, of what Noon says. So there's a particular example that I always remember where the phrase is about um, liberté de merde and pays de merde. So your shitty freedom and shitty country. And I thought that, you know, merde had been used deliberately. So I translated as shitty because, you know, same thing. And Davina just asked me really bemused, like, why didn't you say fucking? And I said, well, because you didn't say it. And she said, well, because it doesn't exist in French. You know, if I'd had a word that strong in French, I would have used it. So use it. And so, so I did. So there were lots of kind of details like that where 
Um, it wasn't that, you know, you didn't trust me with the translation, but rather that I think it's actually improved for being able to come back to you and say, you know, what did you mean here exactly? There are a couple of those. And also when Darina would say, no, but this isn't strong enough or um, this isn't violent enough or this word needs to go at the end of a sentence. So it was really, I mean, really a great uh, experience for me. And, um, you know, one that I think has benefited the final manuscript. Brilliant, thank you so much. Thank you, we'll have Anusha and then Susan. Hello, so just wanted to thank uh, both uh, Darina and Helen for uh, this beautiful conversation. I also have a question for Darina. I, want, I wonder why you did not translate the book yourself. Is there a kind of um, personal relationship that you have to French that you wanted to stay uh, um, in, you know, intact? Um, translated or, in English? Yeah. Oh, no, I couldn't. I don't have the capacities for it. I don't have the vocabulary. I don't have the, no, I, I can't. Uh, there had to be Helen. <laughs> uh, I, can, I can say it, but I cannot work on it uh, like this by myself. No, it's not. And I, I prefer to know my limits. <laughs> and I know them, even though I push, I push, but Sometimes you, you give the work to someone who really knows how to do it. It's better than working for years to get what I want. She does it uh, great. She did a great job on it. So good, great work on it. No, no, I cannot, no. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, no doubt. And uh, Helen was uh, writing about her experience and reading it to us. And I was like, this is an, itself another beautiful novel. Thank you so and, much. And really, because because it's it's an, it's an, it's a spectacle vivant in French, we say it's like it's, it's something that's living in this text. And we we did this going back forward and back between both of us, but it was always on the on the on the word that rings right uh, the end of the thing because and and we used to talk about it no you remember on stage I do this so I cannot I have to have this word on this time on this pre uh, precise moment so it was always like this about the music of the text about and when I want to know that if it's really working I act it I, I perform it to myself and I can hear if the rhythm is right it's it's a question of the rhythm Thank you. Susan? Hi. Um, hi. So I've got two questions. Hi, Darina. Um, but hi. One is, um, first of all, I'm absolutely dying to see this performed. And I, um, so I don't know whether you have a plan that you're going to tour this in English and act it in English. I wish. Yeah. <laughs> well, actually, I will, I will always go back to Helen. She's the one who is doing everything <laughs> for this place to be in English. So maybe we could succeed after COVID now to go and do it. Because actually, um, now I'm trying, I might, by the end of this year, we, we perform for a couple of days in Paris, but it's in French. Right. But I would love to come and perform it in English oh, with fantastic. Helen's translation. Yeah. Uh, we have, have to find a, the theater, the we have yeah. to find the place and, and the production, and it's a, it's a, it's a bit a bit, a bit, a bit harder to do it. And we'll see, we'll see. I right. hope so. Excellent, I wish. excellent. Good. Uh, my, my other question is, I'm, I'm just curious about this. Um, I've noticed that this, um, the attendance of this conference just now, uh, there are three guys and the rest of us are women. And I just wonder whether when you do perform it, when you've performed it in France, uh, has the audience been predominantly women? Uh, no, it's a bit like 60, 40, 60 okay. women, 40 men. There's a lot of women that comes. And actually, they're much more uh, touched because uh, they always put themselves on the, my father's place. And they will say, I wouldn't want to, my daughter to have this, to, to go through this if I leave her. And it's, it's, some of them are really in a bad shape after, after the play. Wow. But, 
actually since the beginning i always say this i always say that it's a part of my life it's uh, this this noon and what she's saying because i want them to know if and i was so um uh, rough in the way I, I i make her say things and the way she is and the way she exists because i want them to know that even if she does all this if she's been through all this this doesn't give us the right to hit her to put an her inside him and to just break her yeah and maybe if you don't you, you think the same way for the character on stage, maybe one day in real life, I, I will not be, <laughs> uh, uh, they will not try to break me again. I have another little question. Am I allowed to just, um, it's just, I'm curious as well about the, the, the stage directions being so very detailed. And as you explained, it's it's very much telling um, the reader what's going on in, um, in her head. In her head. And, um, what I thought was um, when editing it together with with um, Michael Killian, who did did most of that actually, and I, I was his little helper. Um, but it's just um, I I assumed that that detailed direction was so that an actor who might not be you would would be able to read that play and know what to be conveying on the stage. Whereas interestingly, your, your comment about it sounded as though you put that amount of detail onto the page because you felt that you wouldn't be able to tell all of that through acting on the stage alone. And so it's as though that, yes, it, the, the, the play script is moving a little more towards storytelling and, and the, the, not the previous novel because it's actually telling us more than you feel could be represented on the stage. So, so that interested me. And also another thing about having that, that much detail about what's going on in the, in the actor's head is what, that I thought therefore somebody who isn't you could act it. And I don't know how you think, I mean, can you imagine anybody else taking this play of yours and being Actually, the actor? As long as it's not in French or in English, it's the language that I speak and I can perform with. Right. Uh, there was an Italian actress that she did it. There's a Mexican actress that she did it. There's a Bulgarian actress that did it. There's a... Oh, wow. A right. Danish, I think. I, yes, there's a lot of them. Uh, I don't accept anyone in France or uh, US or in England to perform it because then I will do. Right. And, oh. uh, and plus in French, so like... I cannot, I'm still, I, I worked on Noon, the same <coughs> character in the second play that it's Marseille is my way. And I still have the third uh, part of it that will come. And I can't let anyone else play it because as if I'm giving them what I'm st still in on construction that I cannot give it to them. I cannot see someone else doing thing that I'm still continuing on working. Right. Uh, so that's why that in French or English I can do it. I, I don't. I, I don't understand why I would let someone else be me while I'm still here. Right. Right. But yes, if some. But in uh, schools, in universities, they prepare it as uh, uh, as their project. They can do it. They can perform it. I never go. I never go to see it. Okay. I never want to see other actresses performing it, because. Uh, I would not, uh, I, I would not, I don't want to put this pressure. And like, right. I've gave them all the, the material, all the details and what I wrote, all the things that she can, because sometimes when we're acting, we're performing, we say, but what, she, what is she thinking about? So I gave them all what she's yeah. thinking about. After that, they, have, they are free to do it, but I cannot see it. Mm. It would be <laughs> torturing. <laughs> <laughs> One thing I found really interesting, I only know, I only knew about it being performed in Italian by someone else. I didn't realize it had been done in other languages. Um, but when I looked it up, the character was called Darina and not Noon. And I, I felt horrified by this, obviously, because, you know, I spend my life insisting on the difference between Darina and Noon. And I don't know if it's just because it's a word that sounds maybe more Europeanizable that's a word. Um, and so maybe it's more recognizable to an Italian audience. Um, but I don't see why that should be an issue in a play that's about the Middle East. 
or whether it's because it's not you performing it that they felt that it was okay to no, it was no. called Darina. Well, certainly in the blurb. I mean, I've not seen it performed, but I've read the blurb and the blurb. No, no, said, it's only just writing that Darina said da da da. But in the play, it was noon, not not Darina. Okay. No. Oh, yeah. But I, I didn't I didn't want to see it because you know that sometimes they do things that I, I don't really like when she was talking about the the, the roulette russe, they made her take a gun like this and, and I don't like this. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we, we, we really need to see this or mm -hmm. to do it this way. So I don't interfere because everyone sees different things, different points, because you know, like the relatives is for them like the exciting thing. So they wanted to make uh, emphasis on it. But for me, it's not at all this way. It's not for the spectacular thing about it that uh, that it's interesting. Uh, so I don't interfere because I really, when I say yes, they're free to do what they want. Thank you so much. We've still got a bit of time for a few other Three questions. Three minutes. Three more minutes. Uh, if I don't have a question, but since we have three minutes, I really want to thank Darina for her wonderful uh, performance. I miss the theater dearly, and I had to turn off my camera a few times and wipe a few tears because I don't want to do that quite publicly. So thank you so much. It was really moving, and thanks so much for being here today. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I, I don't know how the, because I know, you know, I've got more questions, but I think that maybe the best way we could close this is actually going to the reserve text that we had from the day Nina Simone stopped singing and, and letting the audience enjoy a bit more of the play, if that's okay with the two of you. Yes, yes. Rup, rup, rup. J'habitais sur la ligne de démarcation, c'est-à-dire sur la frontière qui coupe Beyrouth en deux. Le centre-ville était une ruine envahie par des arbres fous et des chiens errants. <rire> C'était un temps de fou rire. On ne pouvait pas allumer la lumière à n'importe quel moment, car les francs-tireurs guettaient les ombres sur les murs pour tirer. Une de mes amies, un peu distraite, a allumé une clope dans le noir. Elle s'est reçue une balle dans les fesses. <rire> pour rien C'était d'une futilité, la guerre Je passais mes nuits à l'ouest, à Hamra, au Back Street, une boîte de nuit. La coke coulait à flot. Je dansais comme une folle. Les gens faisaient l'amour dans les chiottes. Ils sniffaient allongés sur le comptoir. Sur le parking, il y avait une chevrolet vert pistache avec des banquettes en cuir rouge. Elle était destinée aux couples qui n'aimaient pas les chiottes. Les romantiques préféraient les pierres tombales en marbre de Carrare du cimetière grec orthodoxe. En juin 1982, l'armée israélienne a envahi le Liban pour chasser l'OLP. Son armée a imposé un blocus de fer à Beyrouth Ouest pour obtenir la reddition de Yasser Arafat. Les avions nous larguaient des tracts. Nous n'avons rien contre les Libanais. Notre objectif est de vous libérer des terroristes palestiniens. Comme l'Est nous était interdit depuis le début de la guerre, on avait pris un appartement à l'Ouest à côté de la cité sportive, qui allait être la première cible des bombardements. C'était comme dans un film d'animation. Je parlais à mon père et une bombe à implosion est tombée à côté. Il y a eu un grand souffle qui a emporté en un clin d'œil les murs et les vitres de l'appartement. Nous nous sommes retrouvés suspendus dans le vide au neuvième étage. Notre maison sera détruite sept fois. À chaque malheur, il y a quelque chose de bon. À l'approche des Israéliens, Nous avons vu des guerres pires l'armée syrienne. Ces blindés reprenaient le chemin de Damas avec tout ce qu'ils avaient pu voler à Beyrouth. Les chars syriens passaient en bas de la maison. Ils avaient sur leurs tourelles des machines à laver, des télés, des lustres en cristal, des vélos, des tables à repasser, des pots de fleurs, des séchoirs de salon de coiffure, des frigos et même des bidets. Mon père hurlait du haut du balcon. « Saloperie d'armée d'indiques et de mouchards !» Voleur de bidets et de chiottes. En fait, j'ai lu un autre passage, pardon. 
page 37. Yes, thank you. Oui. Non, j'étais obsédée, c'était le 4, une seconde, pardon. J'étais obsédée par cette question de la virginité, qui est le seul capital dont peut disposer une fille arabe. Que faire de ce truc Pour moi, la virginité, c'est un peu comme l'aval garantie de fraîcheur qu'il y a sur les paquets de café carte noire. J'avais un copain homosexuel qui m'avait expliqué qu'il fallait se déflorer soi-même, parce que toute femme orientale est condamnée à finir ses jours avec l'homme qui lui a arraché la valve en plastique. Au Liban, on dit « dévirginiser ». Je dévirginise, tu dévirginises. Oh, quelle angoisse J'ai décidé de l'enlever moi-même. À minuit, j'ai appelé papa qui vivait à Nicosie pour le tenir au courant. « Tu as raison, ma fille. Tu sais comment ils disent les Libanais. Je l'ai ouverte. » comme si la femme était une bouteille. Tu te vois demain dans les bras d'un mec qui va t'ouvrir au décapitaire comme une bouteille de Seven Up À ces mots, j'ai fermé les yeux et j'ai mis le doigt profond. J'ai senti du sang sur ma main. J'ai respiré, j'ai dit, « Je suis libre, papa !» Et j'ai raccroché. I was obsessed with the concept of virginity, the only asset an Arab girl can have. What should I do with it? For me, virginity is like the seal on a jar of uh, golden black. A gay friend once told me, you have to puppet yourself, otherwise all Arab women are condemned to finish with the man who broke their seal. In Lebanon, they say, diversionize. I diversionize, you diversionize, how stressful. So I decided to do it myself. At midnight, I called my father, who was living in Nicosia at the time. To tell him what I was going to do. You're right, Noon. You know what they say in Lebanon. I popped her open as if women were bottles. Can you see yourself cuddling up with a man who'd pop you up, who'd pop you open like a bottle of beer? No. So, no sooner had he said it than I closed my eyes, took a deep breath, and pushed my figure inside myself as hard as I could. I felt blood on my hand and started breathing again. I said, I'm free, Papa. And I hang up. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, ladies. I have to leave you. Sadly. Thank you. Thank you so much. I don't think I don't think we have any other words than to say massive, massive thank you. Mille merci to, to Darina and to Helen. Enjoy the thank rest of Cannes Festival. <laughs> A great million thanks to Helen, who is like behind all of this. Thank you, Helen. Oh, it's my pleasure, and it's brilliant to see you. Have a wonderful time at the festival. Bye, all. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for everybody who joined us for the keynote. Thank you again to, to Helen and to Darina. And I think, you know, we, we definitely need a break now just to sort of, as, as Adina was saying, wipe a few tears and sort of get back into, into the program. But we've got a break now and we'll see everybody back at three o'clock for panel number three. So in about an hour's time. But as always, you can always stay in the session. And if you've got any other questions or if you want to have discussions, feel free to, to stay on in the Zoom session.